I mean, I think the problem with the pasteurization is that people can't digest it immediately, so they have better results with digestion from the raw dairy. But point was that the growth factors in, in dairy are left more untouched when it's raw. And so the problems come down the line that you're using um, this dairy, which is only really, you know, designed to make a small animal into a large animal. And so it has a lot of growth factors and that can be more damaging and more sort of cancer risking in the future. And I thought, hey, you never know. That's kind of an interesting one. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> Vegan guru. Yeah. No, I, I never really shouted about that too much. I did about the vegetarian and the Ayurvedic thing, but... Uh, mm-hmm. I think by the time I tried veganism, I was so ill already and it made me even worse. I wasn't going to shout about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's, um, you know, I mean, that, that's interesting, you know, transition into it anyway, you know, because you, you were saying that you actually wrote several books on plant-based nutrition in the nineties. So this was something that you were very much into and you were doing yoga and so forth. And just because being part of that culture you know it was all about being plant-based and and so you got into that if, I, if i'm not mistaken can you tell us uh, about that and how, how you basically uh, came came around to the to the light yeah <laughs> sure well i i think it sort of through the 80s and uh, 90s i got very involved in uh, the whole indian spiritual thing and meditation and whatever and they do tend to preach that uh, vegetarianism you have this absolutely ridiculous thing that uh, you know, you're not going to get enlightened or you're not going to ascend if you eat any animal flesh. And it's it's such incredible nonsense. Mm. Um, you know, there's it just, just like, like you know, there's probably 95 to 99% bullshit in anything that's put out there. And it's the same with the whole spiritual thing. There's some great gems in it, but most of it's rubbish. But I got caught up in that and I started to study the whole um, Western interpretation of Ayurveda, which is, uh, you know, Ayurvedic medicine. And it's 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 completely misinterpreted because, like we said on our last chat, it's um, you know they 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 say that it's meat is 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 like nectar, it's like amrit, it's the meat of freshly killed animals, the most nourishing thing for the body. Yeah. But I never read the proper texts back then. I just read you know a few Westerners who misinterpreted it and sort of translated that into my own books. And you know when you do that kind of thing, you you notice certain little benefits. But all you're doing really is sort of balancing one plant toxin against another and sort of mm-hmm. using things at different yeah. times of year. And so, you know, the results are very sketchy. Um, and then after doing that, you know, I, I, I got more into training and owned my own gym and ran it in the late 90s. And I got pretty big. <laughs> Nowhere near as big as you, you monster. <laughs> but I got, I got big. And, uh, and, and I thought... Um, you know, yeah, I'm on the right track here. I know how to train. You get these people training real heavy and abbreviated and all that, got a load of people big. But when they'd say, how do I get my abs out? I never really knew. It was always that calorie controlled nonsense, you know? Yeah. And um, I never got really lean. I was never fat, but I, I never got really lean. I never never got a good set of abs, even though I was writing for mountain bike mags and right, doing loads of cardio as well and all that nonsense. And um, then the first time I got, a set of abs was lying on the sofa eating tons of fat and meat uh, and yeah. completely crippled at 50 years old 10 years ago <laughs> and uh, and there was a set of abs and I thought right everything I thought was wrong um but before that uh, a couple of years before that um I I just I'd had a load of niggles you know and for years I'd been living on um um non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and painkillers and all sorts because I always had a really painful back and then one foot started to really hurt, all the bones in the foot. And then, um, then I got iritis. And they said, have you got some awful arthritic, arthritic condition? You know, And I said, no, because I didn't know really then. I just thought I had a painful back. You know, And I was always a chiropractor, so much that I'd learned almost all their moves. And in yeah. the gym, I used to be able to just adjust everybody because I'd learned it. And half yeah. my friends were chiropractors. I spent so long there. Um, but then... Um, you know, it was 2010, just come back from Thailand, a holiday in Thailand, and um, one ankle just blew up. And I thought, I think this is an old injury that I had from um, uh, falling off a climbing wall years ago and really wrecking that that ankle. And um, I thought, I didn't think much of it. I thought it's a bit weird. 
But then the other ankle blew up and then the knee came up like a balloon. And then my neck went, I couldn't move that, you know, and it just went through all my body. Yeah. And eventually, you know, they said, oh, it might be reactive arthritis and that'll disappear. And but we'll have to wait and see. I mean, surely isn't every arthritis reactive arthritis yeah. <laughs> reacting to something right that they don't know. So anyway, it didn't disappear. And then I thought, well, I'll try their drugs. And I tried some steroids. And it's marvelous, isn't it, really? Because after three days, you're kind of normal. You yeah. think, oh, I'm cured. And it's it's a, a, a absolute false hope. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then they, I wouldn't take the methotrexate, but they did say um, <laughs> you should take, uh, try sulfasalazine. So I tried that and it took me back to my sort of overdosing on psilocybin mushroom days in 1979. <laughs> and I just, I, I ended up having these horrendous psycho experiences. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not, I'm not having that. So I got rid of that as well. And then I just thought, well, I've got to fix myself. These people have no idea, obviously. Yeah. And, um, so I started, first of all, I started fasting and that does help, you know, obviously, because you're not eating anything and you get this lovely remission from it. Mm -hmm. And I just, I thought, well, everything I've written in books, everything I've, um, everything I've been taught is nonsense. So I've got to throw it all out. And I remember one day I found um, <clears throat> a website called Beyond Vegetarianism. And there were two guys running it, two vegetarians. And one of them had gone back to eating meat and one of them hadn't, even though he knew it was in our ancestral diet. And they pointed out that it was our ancestral diet. And um, <clears throat> we never we were never vegetarian. And, and that kind of got me thinking because I was never a militant vegan or closed minded or anything. And I thought this is really interesting. So I started to look more into it and found Natasha Campbell McBride and uh, her GAPS diet. And that just blew me away. I thought, right, you know, I've got to do this because at the time I'd, I'd spent like a year um, uh, to try experimenting with raw veganism because I thought, OK, well, what's really got to cure me if I'm plant based is to go more plant based and then raw plant based. And it was awful. I mean, all the muscle disappeared. Um, and, and I ended up, I was, I was something like 210 pounds, something like that, I think. And then I, I ended up at like 130 and <laughs> lost an enormous amount of weight. And then when I finally went keto and started doing cold thermogenesis, um, I dropped another stone as we call it, you know, and I was about 120 pounds at five foot 10, which is really emaciated. Jesus, yeah. It was very weird. Huh? I said, Jesus, that, that's extremely thin. Yeah. I know it was it was very weird to see because I'd been I'd been used to either being muscular or being a fat bastard. And so to me, it looked really weird. You know, I was either one or the other, yeah. um, you know, depending if I was training and exercising or not. And it was uh, yeah, it was kind of alarming. But I discovered Natasha Campbell McBride and I thought, right, I'm going to go for that. And I'd been doing loads and loads of fasting. And eventually I was just wasting away. I thought I've got to eat something. And so I remember one day I uh, I thought, right, I've got this down. And I had some bone broth and I, uh, I I roasted a chicken and I got a load of butter. And I thought I broke an 11 day water fast and I'd been feeling amazing. I've been running around, you know, everything had gone in that 11 day water fast. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was the spring, summer, and, and I put this rug down on the lawn and I thought, I'm going to eat this outside. This is going to be the best meal ever, you know, but I got to take it easy. But I was so hungry. I thought, you know, that was so good. I'm yeah. going to have another, I'm going to have another load. I couldn't get up. It hit me that quickly. The joints inflamed, honestly, in a few minutes. Oh, wow. And I thought, oh my God, what have I done? I, and now I've got nothing to eat. It was probably the real low point. Mm. And now I realize it's when the gut's that leaky, chicken and butter, no good. <laughs> mm. yeah. It's very inflammatory. It's walking corn, as Jack Cruz called it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so I, eventually I figured it out, you know, long story short. Yeah. And even with some of the veg, but very few veg, I, I kind of turned it around and I wrote that book on how I fixed it. I think it was mm -hmm. 2014 or so. But then after going carnivore in 2015 and having been carnivore ever since, it's just just amazing. You know, it's yeah. it's everything's gone. The inflammation's gone, everything. Um, feeling much better without the last few veg, obviously. I just know I didn't I never liked them. You know, they're horrible things. And yeah. Um, yeah. and on the days when I didn't cook them, I thought, you know, I feel better anyway. So I just didn't bother. But yeah, uh, yeah it was it was a, a, a great journey. But um, it was one thing was interesting, something that you said uh, on, on one of your shows mm -hmm. um, that you, you I think it was on my maybe you just hardly train or I haven't been in the gym for three months or whatever. And yeah. I had a, an experience like that with um, with with this where Finally, in the winter of 2013, 2014, I got enough inflammation out that I could go train again. And I just had like an Olympic bar and a trap bar and some and some Olympic plates in my garage. And all I did was like 20 rep 
um, deadlifts and, uh, you know, clean and presses and, and, and chins. And that was it. And I was training maybe sort of eight minutes twice a week, that kind of Doug McGuff thing, you know. <clears throat> and honestly, I mean, I, I put on about 28 pounds in that winter. Now, a lot of that was muscle. I would think almost even maybe 20 pounds of it. And it sounds impossible, but I knew how to train. You had to train really sort of brutally. And I had the memory of it, I guess. So I don't know if everybody can do that. But I've, I haven't trained much since then. I just do a bit of body weight every now and again. But none of that muscle's gone on carnivore. You know, it just kind of maintains it. You know, it's nothing like the muscle I had before in the late 90s. But and, and you've inspired me, actually. I'm getting back into it. I'm going to start Good. really going for it again. See yeah. what a real old codger can do. When I took over my gym, I was 35 and I thought I'm an old man. And now I think, well, right now I am an old man. Let's see what we can yeah. do. <laughs> But uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was amazing that just it, it stayed, it stayed absolutely, and um, I never had any problems with losing it. But um, since then, it's it's been it's been an amazing journey. I started uh, where where I, I I discovered you when you popped up on my Facebook group, the Hundred Percent Carnivore and Beyond Facebook group, sharing some amazing stuff. And um, I started that off for like five people from a paleo group who said, "Oh, you've gone carnival. Um, do you fancy starting a group? Help us out with it." Yeah, sure. And it was amazing. I only started it for about five people. And then suddenly, I think there's about 15,000 now or something. Yeah. But the heat we've seen, and I'm sure you have too. I mean, the stories are amazing. All these useless anecdotes with nothing to back them up. But, yeah. you know, and, and the clients that that I I, I, I consult with all, all over the world and wonderful things I've seen, the most beautiful healing stories in all sorts of conditions, especially the arthritic ones that I understand very well because, I understand all the little tweaks and ins and outs of them. You know, that it's not just like, just go and eat some meat. Sometimes it can be a little more than that. But it's, uh, yeah, it's been an amazing journey really out of it. And and I sort of thank every day that that I can still play drums all the time and I can run up and down stairs and I can chase my kids around, you know. And, and there was a time when I thought I'd never be able to do that again. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... Obviously, you know, when you were, you were doing such profound arthritis, like obviously in the medical world, that usually just goes one direction. It only gets worse. And that's, that's in spite of things like methotrexate and other biologicals that then DMARs and so forth that, that try to mitigate and can sometimes reverse that disease, but it, it takes a huge toll on your body. And generally it's going to get worse over time as well. And so being able to just absolutely reverse that is, is fantastic. Um, I was going to go but back. Like I, said, yeah. like I said, the rheumatologist wasn't interested when I went to yeah. see him. He was angry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very strange, that attitude, I think. Yeah, I think so as well. You know, it's just because you know you get you get trained to certain things and well this is this is what the evidence shows. And so I'm like, well, what evidence? You know, because you're you're seeing evidence in front of your face. And a lot of people is just, well, you know, where's the clinical trial? Where's the clinical trial? It's just like, well, you know, if you start seeing patterns emerging, you start seeing people getting better, you know, maybe think and say like, hmm, maybe I should do a clinical trial and see what's, see what's going on here. Maybe be a scientist and, you know, start collecting some data yourself uh, because it's, it's, it's obviously is helping a lot of people. And, and in fact, there are clinical trials and there are studies and so forth going back 150 years, tons of these things. We've just, we just thrown them by the wayside because, they contain meat and we're talking about meat-based diets and high fat. And everyone knows that fat cholesterol cause heart disease. And so obviously you just have to throw those out. So actually the studies are there. The evidence is there in, in the, in the medical literature, in the journals and so forth. But we, we've just ignored these things. You go back to the fifties. This, this is a very different, you know, body of scientific literature as, you know, to, as compared to probably, you know, the nineties or the two thousands. Now it's starting to come back the other way because we have a lot of studies showing that you know cholesterol is has nothing to do with heart disease except possibly being protective of it and so now everything's being being sort of reversed that way but this is this is stuff we knew for quite some time in the scientific li literature and in just in just uh you know folklore and so forth and uh so it's it's good that we're sort of rediscovering that and that people like yourself can just do that through their own personal journey and then help other people um did you did you come to like be a full carnivore just just on your own progression, just trying different foods and see what works for you, or did you you know did, get influenced by anybody, or was it a purely your own sort of journey? No, well, I, I kind of did it quite early in this cycle of it. I mean, I, I think I found a, a website called Zero Carb Zen, 
and right. there was a few people doing it on there. It's, it's a good little website. It's got some inter- interesting info articles on, you know, why people have problems with pork and, and the vitamin C myth and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. sort of puts people off. They think, oh, I'm never going to get, I'm going to get scurvy. Yeah. <laughs> I've, never, I've never seen anyone with scurvy yet. But no. um, so I, I found that, but there was, there was none of this sort of, you know, big shout about it with Michaela and, and Sean and, and, and all of that kind of thing. Mm. Um, so, so I just, I, I just found that I, d- I didn't need it. I, I, I felt so much better without it and I've never liked it. Yeah. And you always get that tray, you know, it's just called the compost tray in our fridge yeah. and, <laughs> and you put stuff in there and then it rots and then you put it in the bin and then it, then you, then you replace it. And I'm just yeah. glad to see the back of that, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, and, and, and so I bring my kids up like that, you know, you met my little one on, on mm. our last chat and, and he keeps arguing that he's had broccoli once, but I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, he's not had vegetables, you know, they're never in the house. I don't mind yeah. if they eat fruit. I, ge- I generally put it in their lunchbox so that the, the dinner ladies don't report me to social services or yeah. something. So they have, a bit, they have a bit of fruit and they have a bit of, uh, and they have a load of meat yeah. and they'll eat the meat. And then the fruit, it hardly ever gets eaten. It just comes back and it goes in a bin. So it's yeah. a waste of money anyway. <laughs> but, you know, and then, then they'll shout for some chocolate and I don't mind that. If, they're, if everything else they're eating is meat, they can have that now and again. I don't mind. But, uh, you know, they're not sick. But uh, yeah, it's it, it it didn't. There was nothing really that influenced me. But then I started to look into all the just our, the anthropology really, and it just made sense mm. because mm. I think if you study, I keep saying to people, if you study sort of circadian biology and you study sort of um, the cycles of nature really, and what nature would give you at a certain time of year in your latitude, and yeah. then you um, and, and then you study anthropology, what we've actually eaten from the bone isotope records and whatever look at indigenous tribes and what they eat and then i think that the the, the whole rabbit hole of deuterium i've got i was going to say to you you know you've yeah. i won't i won't go on about it this time but you've got to get my good friend from the red pill guys graham norbury on sometime and, and go down that rabbit hole because he's utterly brilliant on that he just uh, he's got one of those science boffin heads that i don't have you know <laughs> and he can explain it all but it's really interesting how it ties it in but if you look at those, then it's and the plant toxins, of course, and then it's just it's a no brainer, isn't it? You can see what's happened yeah. with this horrible misinformation. I just find it so sad that, you know, the mainstream has pushed this five a day. The vegans are pushing all this complete nonsense and it it, it just goes it, it filters down to other people. I, it's what I love is when somebody comes to me who's been eating McDonald's and fries and stuff and they say, right, I've got psoriatic arthritis or something. And I say, well, you can eat steak all day and they go great. But when you get a vegan come to you and, and I'm really crippled and, and you think I've got three months of deprogramming here before they're even yeah. going to consider it, you know, uh, that's sad, but yeah. it holds up a lot of people's healing. Yeah. I've, I've found that, um, yeah, if, if people will engage and, and actually have a serious conversation, even if they, even if they are really on the other side of it and, you know, well, what about this and what about this? And they, you know, they're trying really, you know, they think that they have a lot of solid information on the vegan side of things. I find that if I, if they will actually engage, even if it's aggressively, um, I can get them. And I have I have a hundred percent kill rate so far for vegans and vegetarians that in in just personal personal sort of one on one sort of debate and and uh, and discussion. And wow, um, the vegan the vegan whisperer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, That's um, a <laughs> yeah, I had um, I had one. I think I mentioned this, she was uh, finishing her PhD in nutrition and we just went point for point, study for study over actually a course of you know days and so forth. We, we were texting and talking and so forth. And it finally got to the point where she just was sort of stunned silence and just said to me, my entire education was a lie. You know, it's a lie. Like, I know it's a lie. You've proven it to me. You show me the studies, you show me the evidence. Like this was all a lie. I don't even know if I can work as a nutritionist because it's a lie, because as a nutritionist, you have to pitch the textbook and the textbook is pitching low fat plant-based diet, high in carbs, high in sugar. And she was like, I know that that's wrong. And I know that this is causing people harm now. Like, I, I don't, I don't even know if I can work as a nutritionist. Now. She doesn't, she actually became like a, a health coach, like a life coach sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, use her credentials to, um, you know, give her some credence, but, you know, I've, I've found that people can be receptive because so many people are, you know, like you, you, you got into it for a very specific reason. You thought it was the right thing to do. You were around a lot of people that were influencing you. And a lot of people do that as well. They, they go 
vegan or vegetarian for a, you know a good reason to them you know they and they you know think about it no no one just changes their entire life like that and goes in such a restrictive uh, way of eating just just because you know they they've thought about this they've worked on it. it's like maybe for their health maybe for the environment maybe for animal rights and so forth all of which can be uh, actually shown to be beneficial on a carnivore diet as opposed to a vegan diet you know uh, paradoxically it seems in some of these cases but because they've come they've generally come from an honest place if you have an honest discussion and show them the evidence they can come around it's it's the people that you know see or maybe maybe have made a name for themselves in that community and now basically if they if they go back on it they're going to lose their their income and so they're the ones that are really just die hard on this and they just they just won't listen to sense maybe they they know full well but they're still going to pitch it in a way and, and a lot of these people do get caught they get caught you know these vegan influencers and so forth with hundreds of thousands of followers just talking about vegan this and vegan that and how healthy and wonderful it is they get caught eating you know you know sandwiches and hamburgers and things like that because they're just you know they're wasting away and so you know hopefully you know the more voices like yours and um and so forth that get out there just more people will see this and see this because a lot of people have a vested interest in their in their own lives and health and a lot of people think i, I speak to doctors all the time who are generally overweight and they say like, oh well people are just you know fat sick because they just don't listen to the advice they just eat too much fat and do all this and like no that's the problem is they did listen and it, the advice was bad and so now that we're getting more more better advice out there you know people are people are really benefiting from this and it's really good to see um you have gone through quite a lot of other other health issues as well and and with your clients and even with yourself and with your mother have even uh, addressed and benefited recovery from things like cancer is that right yes i've um i that was a great story with my mom um yeah. <clears throat> basically she um I was looking after her for ages. Just one sec. <laughs> little, little Peter's kicking this football around. He's making a proper rack. He's kicking. Yeah. Their school's been shut because of the storms. And so he's kicking a football around in the living room. Yeah. Uh, yes, my mum, she was, um, when she was in her 90s, we, um, she said to me one day, oh, I've got this lump in my breast. I'd been looking after her. She had a stroke in 96 or so when she was on statins, of course. Right. And uh, right. since then, I just threw all the meds in the bin. I didn't even know what I was doing back then, but I just had an intuition. I thought, these are no good. Mm -hmm. She was in a wheelchair. She couldn't walk. She was on that hideous um, um, osteoporosis med that they would take once a week. I forget what it was called. And it, it just made her feel so sick. She'd have to stay in bed for a week. And then the dentist started to discover that this was rotting the bones in, the, mm. in, in, in people's jaws. And so it was doing exactly yeah. the opposite of what it was supposed to do. Yeah. <clears throat> and she was on Vioxx and she was on all kinds of awful things, steroids, everything. She had, um, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, C C some kind of COPD. I'll think about it. I'll think what it was in a minute. But um, she... Uh, she she just got so much better, you know, and in her 90s, she was picking my kids up, running them around with them and whatever. And um, then she said, I've got this lump in my breast. I said, all right, let's check it out. And, and it was really big. You know, I mean, it was a good sort of six centimeters across, really, really tough. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and the skin was was starting to go, you know. Right. And so I thought, well, OK, let's get we were, we'd already got rid of the plants about a year before. Um, but she'd probably had it for about eight years or something, I should think, just never told me, never mentioned it, mm. probably never even noticed it. You know, so many people don't notice their cancer for so long and then they notice it and then the chemo finishes them off pretty quick. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but she anyway, she uh, she she had this lump. And um, so uh, with the gastroenterologist story that, that I, I put up at some point, I think I, t I told you or whatever, where you know, he agreed with me that she should be on this sort of gaps type diet and high fat and whatever. And that, that stopped all the reflux and issues like that. And so I just sat her down and when she got diagnosed with this and I sat her down and, and, and showed her the truth about cancer or the first mm. program of it. Now, I, I think that guy's a bit off base because, you know, he's always going on about plant-based stuff and he does have some people <clears throat> who's had reversals on there and whatever. And, and people do, it, it tends to come back later when you do that but um, do it that way around. But I, at least it showed her that people had done it in some other way. And she said, let's go for it. 
Yeah. So I said, okay, yeah. let's do it. You know, and we got a completely carnivore, except for the occasional bit of Greek yogurt and berries. And and um, she she went completely carnivore pretty much. And then I tried the um, the the proper Rick Simpson oil on her, you know. And so I went and bought it, and I realized it's it's just so absurd that you can get seven years for that because it's uh, it's it's sort of processed. They class it as a class A drug. Absolutely yes. insane. So I was buying her this stuff, you know, and and um, just giving her little bits and whatever, but she was getting really mashed. Mm. And she had this little flat nearby. Um, we used to live in the same big house, but it just became too much for a while looking after her and whatever. So got to this little flat close by, this little apartment. And uh, I, I went around there, you know, and one day she was sweeping the lawn. And, and I thought, what are you doing? And she went, I don't know. And I thought, I can't, I can't leave her alone, really stoned all day at like 90. <laughs> she was so stoned. And it, but it was, actually, it was actually reducing. But um, I thought, I can't do that. So I thought, we'll try something else. We took her off that. And, and, um, and then it sort of stabilized a bit, but it wasn't really going away. And we tried everything, all the Essiac tea and, and all the reishi mushrooms and all that kind of thing, really throwing everything at it. Nothing really worked. And then one day I had this intuition and I just thought so many times I've heard about people with fibrocystic breast syndrome, just painting breasts with iodine and, um, and, and taking iodine, going on an iodine protocol. And this reverses it. There was a friend of mine who wrote for my blog. You know, he wrote, she wrote an article on this great musician, actually. And she wrote under a pseudonym for my blog because she said that when she, she went to, to a hospital with all these uh, uh, lumps, none of them were, were cancerous, but said it was like a bag of marbles. She had more more lumps than anybody had ever seen in there. And she just kept painting it with iodine and they all went away. She didn't take any medication. And uh, she didn't even do a, an iodine protocol uh, drinking it, I don't think. <clears throat> but um, I just thought, well, hang on, if this has worked for that and it's working for these hormonal things for women, and you know, there's so many thyroid conditions around that seem to be really fixed by this, you know, replenishing the iodine. Let's give it a go. So I put her on an iodine protocol and it was for about three months. And I'd read that um, uh, it didn't work. It, it, it often didn't work while you were on it. But when you tailed off it, often a two or three months after that, the, the, the tumor just disappeared. And I thought, ah, well, OK, maybe it's worth a go. And, you know, the oncologist, her oncologist who kept trying to get her to take drugs and she wouldn't and was getting very frustrated with her um, and me, because obviously he thought I was a complete lunatic. And. <laughs> So he, he was saying, you know, well, we probably have to uh, operate at some point, you know. And then I, I actually gave up. After that iodine protocol, I, I'd kind of given up. And I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll just take him, take her down and say, you know, can you do this under a local if it, if it ulcerates? Because she's not going to take a general anesthetic now. And he said, yeah, sure, we can do that. Uh, but I'd rather you took these pills, you know, these, these sort of ones that dissolve these hormonal tumors. Um, because she had one little one on the lung or something, little one on the liver. And we, then that can be a gauge as to whether the other ones are disappearing as we get it to disappear with the drugs. And so I said, no, we're not going down that route because she did try them for about a week. And there was loads of forums of, of real pain in ovaries and, and womb and whatever. And uh, people sort of having very weakness in their legs. And so I thought, well, all right, I'm open to anything. Try it for a week. Try it for a week. She, he said, no, it's, it's totally safe and everything. Indian doctor, and I, and I researched, and I said, you know, this stuff's been banned in India. When I took it, no, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, because of all these issues that you're claiming don't happen. I found forums full of women saying tremendous pain here, you know, uh, pelvic area, loss of, 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 of function of the legs. And so what happened? She was on it for a week, and then I went around there, and she'd fallen over in the bathroom, broken her wrist really badly, you know? I'm like, no, right, that's it. That's enough of this stuff. You know, she'd already said that she was starting to get pains down in the pelvic area. And, and just, so it was like a week. And so I left her, I got, got her off those things. And then I thought, okay, well, I've, I've given up. At least we can get this out on a local. And then I just forgot about it for a while. I just said to her, look, just, I, I wasn't looking at it. I wasn't painting it with ID, nothing. We'd, we'd finished all that. <clears throat> and, and, and I said, okay, well, let's... Um, just tell me if any, if it if it ulcerates through the skin, if it gets painful or whatever, and and then we'll see if we can get this taken off. And this went on for a long time. I thought, well, what's happening? And then one day she said it's going away, and I said, no, I I, I can't believe you. You know, let's have a look. And honestly, I mean, you can see the pics on that, that little video I've got where 
it's reversing. You know, some vegans have come to me and said, you reversed the pictures because <laughs> that could never work. But uh, yeah, it was horrible and sort of uh, like uh, purple and coming through the skin. And then it all went back to the skin, went back to normal. And the, the, the tumor started shrinking and she was fine. Now, it, it, unfortunately, about two years after that, she got two bouts of, um, uh, of pneumonia and the second one took her. But the, 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 the breast cancer never did. And it was shrinking all the time. And I, it, whether it would have gone or not, I, I'm not that concerned. I mean, maybe it leaves some lump somewhere or something. The lumps are not the problem, right? The process is the problem, you know? So, but anyway, well, as you can see, all the skin came back to normal and whatever, and, and, and the lump reduced a lot. And, uh, and, and I'd like to have seen the, the, the culmination of that, but we didn't get a chance. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it, it was lovely, and, and as I said, it's one of the most satisfying moments of my life when that oncologist turned around and said, "How on earth did you do that?" <laughs> it was lovely. It totally disarmed. He was actually a lovely guy. He wasn't one of those arrogant guys. He, he he really did think that I was mad, but he was kind of cool with it. And do you know what? This is what I find with docs: the nearer they get to like emergency room docs or surgeons, the more open they are. Mm-hmm. If they if they if their livelihood doesn't depend on the drug peddling. You know, and he was more of a surgical oncologist. And so he was he, he would sort of chat with me and he'd humor me and he'd laugh. We'd have a laugh about it, you know, and he's going, you're nuts. It's never going to work. And I just go, yeah, OK. You know, he never got angry. <laughs> so to his credit, but he was completely disarmed when he saw that. And uh, I, I just love to see it. I love to see it again and again. These docs waking up and just, you know, with, to, to add to the amazing knowledge that you've got from medical school and then filter out what is great knowledge and what is rubbish is so important these days. I think you went through a bit of, of troubles this past year and uh, thankfully straightened things out, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe walk us through that and uh, maybe people can, can learn something on, on uh, how to best manage uh, their issues. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, last time I was on, I went through the story of, um, you know, how I originally got it. I was really crippled with psoriatic arthritis back in 2010. Mm. And then I I did my vegan phase, lost most of my muscle, then discovered keto and kind of got halfway there. And, you know, from 2013 or so, 2014, when I wrote my um, arthritis, best thing that ever happened to me book. And I was kind of almost there, but I didn't go fully carnivore till 2015. And then things were great for years and years. And, you know, I thought, you know, this is this is fantastic. I've uh, I've sorted everything. And, um, you know, I've um, I, I, I've fixed the gut. I can I can take some liberties. And so last year I took some liberties. Now, I didn't eat any plants, had enough of them. I don't want to eat that, that stuff. But, um, yeah, I was traveling around a lot, you know, and I was playing with the Daz band. We had this number one single a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, I won't even mention the lyrics of it because we'll get the channel pulled down. But we weren't particularly we weren't particularly complimentary about the um, the whole business that went on with sticking stuff in people's arms and all sorts. But um, it got to number one. We got Shadow Band and whatever, and they soon got that off the charts. But um, I, I had some festivals to play and traveling around. And I thought, right, I'm okay. You know, I have a bit of a rock and roll lifestyle. I'll, I'll drink a few too many brandies. I'll smoke a few spliffs. I'll do that. But, you know, I don't think that's what did it. I think it was, uh, well, we'll come on to the Oxalate thing in a while. But I, I think what happened was I, I decided that, you know, it's very difficult, isn't it, to get really good meat when you're on the road. It's it's easy to get chicken, pork. It's easy to get eggs. It's easy to get cheese. And so I was probably eating too much of that sort of thing. And I thought, well, it's all right, you know. And I, I was putting a bit of fat on. I mean, I was nothing like I was. Can I share the screen a sec? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Make sure you can. Yeah. Are you able no, to say it? Uh, no, it says it's still disabled. Let me just... But I think on the share screen button, you can allow screen sharing. But I just thought I'd show this one quickly because I didn't last time. Okay. I, I think I've given you... There we go. There. Can you see that? Yep. <laughs> yeah wow well, that, yeah. that was um that was me 2010 on the left probably 2011 on the right 
Wow. And that was when I, I'd really messed up. I'd never shown it before or after before. But, you know, that was that was the last time. It's funny. Around that time, my my um, ex-wife um, went to um, India and went to see an Ayurvedic doctor, a Vaidya, and showed a picture of me. And, so, and he said, some people can stay healthy when they're a bit overweight, but he can't. Give him a few years and he's going to be really, really sick. Well, I didn't really take that into account. I didn't know what to do about it in those days anyway. Um, and so um, he was right. That was probably, I don't know, 2005 or something. And so 2010, yeah, I was in real trouble. There it was. And then I kind of went vegan and then discovered the keto thing. But I mean, that's 90 pounds down in about, I don't know, eight months or something like that. Wow. And it, it was just after that picture was taken that I got really, really sick. But anyway, I've that seen that and we'll get rid of that thing. But um yeah, so I I I kind of put on a bit of weight last last year. Nothing, nothing like, you know, I still had a flat stomach and whatever, but it was in the back of my mind. I thought, I wonder if I'm just not designed to carry any fat, you know, eating dairy and stuff like that. It it, it can do it. And then I came back from the last festival and a few days, a few days later, it was a real stressful year, loads of money weirdness and selling rental houses and sales falling through. And it was one of those hideous years, you know, it probably all of it added up. But, you know, I started to get some bit of a, a sort of a niggle in one knee. And I thought, well, you know, if I ever eat anything wrong, all I need to ever do is just do a day's fast and then come back onto the program, it disappears. I'll be fine. It did not get fine. And it was like, it wasn't a flare, it was a supernova, you know? And I, I, I dropped 45 pounds that I didn't want to drop at the time. I was 165 pounds, went down to 120 pounds. I was completely Jeez. emaciated, you know, five foot 10. Wow. And um, I was confined to the sofa, you know? I couldn't stand, I was on crutches if I did. I, I, I was, um, the pain even at rest was horrific. Uh -huh. um, but I thought, Ah, well, you know, whatever's happened. And it started off actually uh, late last summer with a kidney stone. And I thought, but I haven't taken any oxalates for ages. Just the odd, like over again, over this last year, the odd cheat with a bit of chocolate or something. Mm -hmm. I thought, that's not enough to do that. And I had Sally Norton on my podcast a little while ago. And I said to her, well, is it possible like eight years into carnivore, you could have a real oxalate dump? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It's just one of the theories. And she said, oh, yeah, it is. So I wondered with the, if it hadn't have started with a kidney stone, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. Mm -hmm. But I did. And I was lying on the sofa there. And I thought, I'm supposed to be this carnivore sort of arthritis guru. And here I am wasting away in tremendous pain. This is embarrassing, man. Anyway, it was it was lucky, actually, because, I mean, previously it took me about three years to get out of that mess, and this time it took me about three months. Mm. But it was because I had the confidence, you know, and this, this is a kind of a, a warning to, to autoimmune people. And, and I was chatting to Zofia as well, you know, yesterday on my podcast as well. It's going to come out soon. We're on a real deep dive into autoimmunity. And I think, I think she's honestly right, particularly about dairy. You know, you can get the odd flair from pork and chicken if you're autoimmune, if it's bad stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, dairy, I, I, I'm starting to re I've always thought it's kind of dodgy and advised anybody who comes to me for a consult not to do the dairy. But, you know, Zofia saying that um, even a few molecules can keep it going and, you know, it can it can have it repercussions for years if you filled yourself full of dairy is mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating with all the, the sort of growth factors in it. But yeah, I just had to go completely PKD, fully leap beef lamb, fatty beef lamb, salt and water, and that's it. And gradually, gradually, it 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 it, it uh, turned itself around. But you know, I see a lot of people who are who go beef lamb, salt and water, and it doesn't stop immediately. You know, it's like stopping a ferry, isn't it? Even if the gut's healed, you can still have these sort of repercussions of it, sort of um, little flares along the way, and it goes up and down, up and down. And it's to really give people confidence that, you know, they, it, it was, yeah, at one point, my, my missus, who is, a, who is a nurse, she took some bloods, took them down to the doctor. I, I didn't want their interpretation on me. You know? I, I wanted to look at them and, and I wanted to send them to Zofia as well to sort of check there's nothing really horrific going on, um, you know, beyond the autoimmunity that I'm familiar with. And of course, the docs, you know, they called me up and everything. They said, no, you probably got cancer and all of this. This is really bad. This is, you know, the, the GBL said, look, I haven't. 
And listen, even if you've lost that much weight in that short time, yeah, you probably got cancer. We're gonna, like, you know, no, no, I haven't. I said, I know what's going on here. And um, even if I did have cancer, I'm not going to do anything that, that you recommend. So just thanks. Thanks for the results and all that, you know. I'll uh, I'll send them to Zofia, and she said, "Yeah, you know, it's it's just horrific inflammation." But I mean, to give you an idea, my CRP when I wrote that book was like, well, when I wrote the book about the times when I was sick before, it was like when it was tested, it was like about eighty-five, which is horrific. But back in November last year, it was one hundred and ninety-two CRP. That's crazy. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. But for those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore Market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Behind. Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks, guys. You know that I mean, was on fire. I mean, that, that, that's someone with, with, with you know septicemia in the, in the ICU. You know, that's that's. Right. I know that the only time the only time high CRP. You know, yeah, the only time I've seen that anything like that was my mom when she was dying of pneumonia, and the hair was like 250. Yeah. And, and, you know, I thought, whoa, that's a beast. No wonder I felt that much pain. Mm. But it was a it was a real severe one. And then I had it done again, I, I think, in a month and it was 19. And I didn't I didn't do it after that. But it came down pretty fast. And and I now I don't know. I don't know what I am now. I, I feel fine. I'm fine. But, and then, you know, the weight started coming back on. And it was funny because uh, uh, people were saying, you, you know, um, Oh, don't go on Zoom. Don't do anything. Don't don't go on any on your YouTube channel. And I thought, no, I got to be honest, man. You know, I I'm, I'm going to be open about this, and I'm I'm going to show myself looking like that. <laughs> so, and, Look and, how much and weight so, I lost? Dramatic carnivore weight loss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I put back on a, a good sort of 15, 20 pounds now. Again, you know, in that time. I managed to get training again. I'm not going to put any fat on anymore. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've actually uh, actually got some legs to go in my trouser legs now, which I didn't have before. You know, it's annoying because it was particularly uh, horrific looking down at those stringy legs because, you know, late 90s, I ran a gym. And I remember a time when I used to, you know, and after all these sort of uh, extensive periods of 20 rep squatting, and I used to have to buy jeans that were too big for my waist to even get my quads in, you know. And so for me, it was, you know, you probably know the problem there, right? Yeah. Yeah, and 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 so to look down at, at, at legs with the, 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 like a string and then a lump and then a string, it was like you know it's taken some coming back from that. So, but I, I think just to just to give people to come on here and give people real confidence that that whatever you whatever you're going through. This, I did a lot of other things. I got all the lights sorted. I was grounding as much as possible. I was doing all my woo-woo emotional stuff and all that kind of thing and, you know, just chilling out. But really, that magical place of just beef, lamb, salt, and water, if you're autoimmune or even if you've got better from autoimmune and got things still niggling, get on it. It's it's the, the difference between regular carnival with a bit of pork, chicken, a bit of eggs, a bit of dairy, and proper you know, lamb, beef, salt, and water, really fatty, the sort of PKD approach, it's night and day. Mm -hmm. it, it really is night and day. I mean, the improvement is greater from crappy carnivore to, to that really pure carnivore to uh, the, than it can be sometimes from a regular diet to, to carnivore, including dairy and stuff like that if you're autoimmune. And, yeah, a huge eye-opener for me. And it was funny. We did we did this big fat challenge. It was called a big fat challenge because we were, you know, Ben Hunt and I were trying to set up something for people to come along and have calls every day. And and, and, it, it, and it was it was for the big fat bit was to get people aware of animal products, you know, animal fats and how healthy they are and that kind of thing. That was why it's called the big fat challenge. We went into all the other stuff too. But it's funny, so it's documented from the 1st of January, and you can see me come on there looking like Skeletor, 
and then sort of filling out as it goes along. And, and now, you know, we're building some of this muscle back up. I'm fine. I like this level of leanness now. It feels really good again to, you know, have um, be pulling in my belt on trousers and stuff like that. You know, I got like a 30 inch waist again. It was like 28 at one point. It was just too little. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it's nice to be there again. But that was basically the story of what happened. And And, and just to say to people, you know, Take care because it's funny. Sometimes the body can go, do you know what? You're going to get a big slap. And if you built up some of these toxins or whatever it is that goes in there, I mean, you know, I, I'm still after studying it for so long. I'm still kind of unclear on exactly the mechanism of what causes autoimmunity, causes these flares. Is it molecular mimicry? Is it toxins accumulating in certain parts of the body? Is it? But whatever it is, you know, that PKD thing really does seem to seem to nail it so yeah that was what happened to me well i mean well that's pretty scary you know i mean you lost so much weight that, that that's i mean literally very dangerous amount of weight loss yeah. and obviously uh being as as weak and in pain as you were not being able to get off the couch i mean that's, that's quite scary um so it was, it was the kidney stone that then triggered you it was like okay wait this is this is something that i've, I've got to change and i've got to really go strict on this or, or no, no, it was, it, it was a joint pain. I mean, I thought okay. the kidney stuff, I mean, I, I thought I'd already looked a whole load into oxalates and, 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 and whatever. And I remember when I had a kidney stone in like 2012, mm -hmm. it was kind of obvious to me now that I was going to get one because I was doing almost lethal doses of spinach smoothies every day. You know, <laughs> I was, I was, I was putting a whole pack of spinach in and then because it tastes so fucking awful, Ugh. I was putting all this other stuff in, you know, like avocados, bananas, a load of honey, all that sort of thing. But I was also thinking, oh, let's throw a load of turmeric in there as well and whiz up some almonds. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who's done as, as much uh, oxalate loading as I have during that period. Yeah. It was horrific. Um, and so it was it was pretty much predictable that soon after that I'd have a kidney stone. It was like kind of a 12 miller, you know, and it got stuck in the ureter and I had to have it, you know, a laser up my knob and get it lasered out and broken up. <laughs> and it was, it was uh, and then I thought, hey, great, I'm free of that at least, you know, I've got rid of it and whatever. But I'm thinking if I was dumping oxalates back then, if oxalates, if oxalate dumping is an actual thing, which again, I'm, 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 sort of I, i'm open-minded to because i so fear yesterday was going oh no it's not it's not like that it's not an issue and i had sally on you know mm -hmm. who's saying oh yeah of course you can dump you know and have all these horrific issues but uh back then i, I thought yeah it's kind of obvious that, that that's what's happened but this time i thought i haven't taken in any and then i thought hang on a minute actually the body can dump really slowly i could have had a kidney stone building up for years there even from the spinach smoothies years before Mm -hmm. if some of the theories are correct. So I thought, oh, well, that's okay. You know, maybe that's it. Maybe that's done. I don't know whether the joint thing had anything to do with an oxalate issue. Mm -hmm. Maybe it did. Maybe it was it was just the dairy and, and triggering the autoimmunity again that decided to come on in a, in a very sudden and very severe form. But, in um, you know, it was also around the autumn equinox. And I think... Um, you know, that is a time when a lot of people get sick. And so it was it was a lot of things kind of built up. That's a, a time of, you know, to go into the woo-woo side. It is a sort of natural detox time of the body. Mm -hmm. And and I think a lot of people get sick around there, which is why, you know, some people, some people, not that they ever have, of course, but some people might be able to around that time, maybe say fake a pandemic or something like that. But, um, <laughs> you know this uh this sort of thing can happen around that time so you know who knows who knows what it was but uh, hopefully no more kidney stones i mean i did have a scan on it i tell you what it was it was quite cool actually when i went down with the uh <laughs> for the for the kidney stone thing because i thought i, I was in real pain and I thought, uh, I'm going to have to go and figure it out. It would just come in atta attacks. It wasn't constant, but it was horrific. You know, my kids one day, they were going, are you going to die, Daddy? I'm going, no, I know what's going on. I'm not going to die. Yeah. But I was rolling around the floor. And you can't get comfortable in any position. You're bending over the chair, like sitting down, standing up. It's horrific when it's going on. Mm. But um, I went to see this uh, urologist. And he was really cool. You know, I went to this sort of, I got this private consult because I didn't want to wait for the NHS. And I went down to this this place and I was his last consult for the day. And I went in and uh, he he was very cool. And he he had his COVID muzzle on, you know, and um, 
And I said to him on the way to the to the office, and I said, "Listen, man, don't, you can take that off, please. Don't don't wear that for me." And it's like, and he went, "Oh, I'll oh, thank God for that." You know? <laughs> and we had a, we had, we had a chat about all that stuff. Well, I thought this guy's pretty cool. Yeah, and. Um, you know, I was, I was, it was before the joint thing hit. And so I was really jumping around perfectly mobile, looking healthy and all that. And, um, and I got chatting with him and you never get this with an English doctor. You get two minutes, five minutes or whatever. We were there for an hour and a quarter chatting about carnivory. Nice. It was amazing. And he was brilliant. And, and, and then he said, you know, thank God for that. You know, I, I've got something now I can tell my, um, my secretary who is, uh, who's a vegan, you know, and then he told me later, <laughs> He told me later that um, his secretary had been following my channel and everything and, and was, oh, wow. was starting to come around and he was starting to come around and really, really getting into it. And then I put them onto your channel and he'd been watching, he'd been watching you and he'd been watching Sean and all of that. Yes. And it was really cool. But anyway, he told me, yeah, you know, you, you, it's one kidney stone. That's it. it. There's no sign of them anywhere else. So I thought, right, okay, got rid of that one. Um, and uh, no bother. So, but it, it is interesting to think that even after all these years, if Sally's right and some other people with these um, with these plant toxins, because I mean, I, I often share your plants are trying to kill you video because you've just nailed it there. I mean, I thought I knew about plant toxins, but uh, you know that's a popular one to share with people. <laughs> but it, it's years later that you can still suffer the repercussions. Of, of, of these things and and that's no reason not to go carnivore i mean mm. you, you know there's a there's a there's an old saying isn't there the best time to plant a tree is 40 years ago and the next best time is today <laughs> so 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 just do it you know even if you're going to get these issues you get through them but um wow yeah so here i am the the the, the, the ultimate example of how to poison yourself properly on veganism and how long it can go on yeah well yeah, well, I mean, it's a good, it's good, it's good testimony as well. And, and also, you know, I mean, we, we sort of you know, said as a cautionary tale, I think it is, you know, because there are, there are some people like yourself and, and others who are, are just very, very sensitive and uh, to anything outside of that PKD diet, just the red meat and water diet, even, even other meats and dairy, especially I've, I've seen a lot of that with patients with dairy. They don't, they don't handle it very well on a, on a autoimmune when they have autoimmune issues, you know, even uh, Michaela Peterson, you know, she says that, you know, she has pork. It's like worse than if she eats fruit, you know, she, and she really yeah. reacts badly to it. And this is years, years and years and years down the track. So, you know, I think it's, you know, it, it is difficult to say exactly what's causing these sorts of things, but whatever it is, it's in the food and, uh, and eliminating that and just going just, just to, you know, beef lamb, salt and water seems to help. And, you know, some people are a bit more stubborn. They need, you know, grass fed beef or lamb and uh, grass finished, I should say, beef or lamb. But, um, you know, whatever it is, it's something in there and something we're reacting to and something that's that's causing harm. And just something that, that people sort of need to remember is that if you have one of these sensitivities and you're a bit more sensitive to things, you know, yeah, I think I think just beef, lamb and water is probably the best thing that any of us could do. I don't have any of those problems, but I, I feel way better just eating that. And that's, so that's why I naturally prefer to go to, but you know, people that, you know, don't have that luxury of being able to eat any meat that they want dairy on occasion or whatever, you know, it's, it's important to know that. And so, you know, people knew coming to carnivore, especially with autoimmune, you know, to try to help their autoimmune issues, you know, that's something that's, that's, I think very important. You know, if someone's, if someone's new coming to carnivore, have autoimmune diseases, what would you, tell them, how would you caution them? How would you have them approach uh, their diet? Well, it, yeah, it, it's, I, I, w I always try to get them to do this from the start. You know, I, I tell them that beef, lamb, salt and water really is the least traumatic thing that you can put into your body. Because a lot of people come to me with autoimmunity saying carnivore isn't working. You know, I, I, I've learned, I've, I've got some improvements a little bit, but it's not really working that well. And then every time it's one of those things, it's pork, chicken, eggs, dairy, or all of them, or not eating enough fat. You know, that, that, that business of really keeping the fat high, according to the PKD ratios, is, is a real game changer as well. 
a lot of people, I think they can still react to too much protein. If the gut's still leaky, maybe some of those proteins are getting through anyway, even if they're not the type of proteins that would wreck the gut, like glutens and whatever. So some of those are still getting through and you can still get a reaction to it. That's that's the kind of uh, view I have of it. But it's a shame, particularly with the pork, you know, because I could just eat pork crackling all day. Yeah. I mean, it's the nicest thing in the world, isn't it? But yeah. but no, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't go well with me. But strangely, um, bacon isn't so bad, particularly if you get some good bacon. It's it's OK. I can get away with that now and again, but not fresh pork for some reason. And. Uh, there was a good uh, uh, article on it's on zero carb zen if you put zero carb zen pork in if anybody wants to see that and they've got some other uh, it's a very old article there some other issues where where, where sometimes the pork will will uh, sort of um thicken the blood or something like that and give some weird effects to some people but i i think a lot of this is down to the fact that the pigs are not fed what they're supposed to eat you know they do get fed a load of crap they really do and you know, the first time I ever chatted to Sophia when my missus got diagnosed with Graves' disease, and she was saying, yeah, pork is great, it's all fatty and whatever. And I said, well, maybe not in this country, you know, because out in Hungary they've got those mangalitsa pigs and, and, and they've probably eaten what they're supposed to eat and, and the, the fat is probably very, very good. Mm -hmm. But when you, get, when you get the pigs that have eaten all the soy and all the, I don't know, old socks and condoms and whatever they feed them, I mean, God knows what they feed them, man. Yeah. But, um, you know, the fat's pretty high and linoleic acid is pretty high in deuterium as well, that other rabbit hole, you know. So it, I think it can have a bit of an effect on on, on people. But I, I say to people, really, you know, I I mean, Sophia, again, she, she I keep mentioning her just because she's fresh in my mind. We chatted so much yesterday about this and she's really not into fasting because, you know, she says that, that you know, you get all, your, all the nutrients you need and all the protection you need from a full on PKD diet. And I believe her. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, you, you get people coming to you maybe who aren't carnivore and haven't understood the link between food and they don't believe you. And and they're like, you know, just eat meat. Come on. You know, they, you get that kind of person. And then, and then so you say, well, listen, just try fast, just try fast or a dry fast couple of days. And you just see how the inflammation dies down. And they and then you, they often they come back and they go, wow, I believe you. My doctor told me that diet had nothing to do with it. <laughs> And so you can kind of show them in that way that, that that it does lead them in with that. But a lot of people have heard about it now, and most of the people who come to me are, you know, I've tried carnivore, I've tried this, I've tried that, or but I'm all right with a bit of dairy, I'm all right. And and that's an interesting one because I think, you know, we were we were I, also when we were it was a shame you didn't get to the Sheffield conference. That was fun, you know. It was but you know, good to see you there blowing up all the crap, you know, <laughs> with Sean that time. With I love that that one with the picture split and it's got carnivore and vegetarian. Yeah. <laughs> you can see the difference. It's a nice meme there. But I was there, we were there cheering you on. I was sitting there next to Sophia during that actually, and we were cheering you on. It was brilliant. But, you know, we took her out and showed her around the Peak District and whatever. And we went on this walk and then and then she dropped something kind of interesting on us early in the, earlier in the day. And I put this silly little vid up, you know, with these daft questions for Zofia. It was before the proper podcast. But she said something that raw dairy is actually worse than pasteurized dairy. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And, and I thought, you see, I've got an open mind. It was funny. So was somebody on the YouTube channel, when I put that up, it came up, Phil, has anybody else told you that you're easily led? <laughs> and I said, well, because, because I didn't punch her in the face as soon as she said it or something. You know, I mean, I, I, I'll listen to anything, man. I, I'll listen to anything. Another one was saying this woman is certifiable. But actually, her points are quite interesting. Mm. And that is that the main danger with dairy. I mean, I think the problem with the pasteurization is that people can't digest it immediately. So they have better results with digestion mm. from, the raw, from the raw dairy. Mm. But... Her point was that the growth factors in, in dairy are left more untouched when it's raw. And so the problems come down the line that you're using um, you're using this dairy, which is only really, you know, designed to make a small animal into a large animal. And so it has a lot of growth factors. And that can be more damaging and more sort of um, um, cancer risking mm -hmm. in the future than pasteurized dairy and i thought hey you never know that's kind of an interesting one that i hadn't heard before but uh, of course all the raw raw milk guys you know get very angry about that because they have um 
there's a lot of tales of people healing on on raw me- raw milk. Yeah. But I, I think I suspected, and 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 Zofia agreed yesterday that it's kind of like those people who have sort of uh, benefits from something like Gerson therapy, you know, initial benefits. But quite often the problems come down the line where you just swap one plant, one set of plant toxins for another, and then you know down the line you 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 get problems and on not only a recurrence of the original issue but other issues as well. You know, obviously with all the malnutrition and and and. Um, emaciation that comes with something like trying to push Gerson therapy for too long. Mm-hmm. And maybe the same thing is happening with the people on, on the raw milk kind of cures. Yeah. Who knows, you know? You have to be open-minded. Uh, you know, I was told in my first few months of medical school that, you know, the, you know, the information and, and understanding of medicine and how, how everything works is so fast paced that by the time we graduated medical school, everything we learned was going to be out of date. And so you just had to, you had to keep track of things. You had to stay on top of things. And so you had to have an open mind as well. And so, and you know, I, I noticed this too, uh, you know, of doctors, depending on where they are in their, in their training, medical students will just listen to anything a senior says as, as like something coming out of the Bible, because they just, they just don't know anything. And they're just like, Oh, okay, this is someone else. They, they're, they're going to know everything. Um, interns and sort of first, second year doctors, same way. They're just trying to soak up information. Then you start getting, you know, a, a few years after that and people start solidifying because they're doing exams or doing boards or doing all these sorts of things. And basically it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. It matters if it's in the book because they're taking an exam. And so everything that's out of the book, that's, that's the gospel. And so if it, if it goes against that, a lot of people are just like, no, 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 this is what it says in the book. I'm not listening to that. Not actually that that many people, because you you can actually put forward a pretty convincing argument. Um, you know, if you if you have experience with that, which I have, I've only met a few people that were just, you know, not really receptive to that. Most people are, but then you get the people that are past that, and they're, um, you know, they've they've gotten to a stage in their career that they've seen things being turned on their heads and they were doing things for 20 years and they found out, Oh, no, no, that's killing people. Don't do that. And they've had to reverse that. And so they understand that, you know, things change all the time. And as long as someone is providing, you know, good evidence, um, you know, you should listen to it. And, but you know, you're always saying like, okay, where's your evidence? How do you back that up? Whatever. And if you do, they go, Oh, okay, fair enough. Um, I've always been dealing with a lot of surgeons doing that. So that's, that could be why I've gotten a lot more receptive people. And, uh, as I, I think I mentioned, you know, last time we spoke, you know, the gastroenterologists really got their knickers in a twist when I was telling their patients about, um, you know, they were asking me, is, like, is there anything I can do to avoid surgery for Crohn's? And I was like, well, yeah, there are these studies that actually show that if you alter your diet, even go on an elemental diet, you, you can, it, it has a better efficacy than steroids and it keeps people in remission and so forth. And, you know, I mentioned uh, Dr. J. H. Salisbury, who was curing people with this since the 1800s with a pure red meat and water diet. And all the way up until 1975, um, there was a book called the stone age diet. Again, a gastroenterologist basically arguing you, my profession doesn't need to exist if you don't eat plants. And, you know, and, and, and then we, we completely forgot about that because in 1977, the USDA said cholesterol causes heart disease, end of story, all meats, bad, all fats, bad, just get rid of it. And, and all this massive body of knowledge just got thrown out the window. And so I, you know, I meant, I would mention these to people because I, I don't think it's ethical to just say, no, 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 surgery is your only option when clearly it isn't. And I never would like to, I would never want to pressure anyone into trying anything. I just say, look, here's some information. Here's some things you may not have known about. And here's some resources. You look it up, you do your own research. And if it works great, surgery is always on the table. Surgery can always happen. You know, you're not in a rush. You don't have a perforated bowel, you know, this, this can, this can wait. And they got absolutely pissed and, you know, the surgeons yeah, haven't. So yeah, maybe, I mean, that is a, uh, a good way of thinking about it. People that are dependent on the prescription and that's only, and that's the, the way you think, you know, you have this problem, here's this pill to fix it. And that's, that's really how we're taught in medical school, you know, and like, there's a problem. This is the solution. You know, It's a shame because, you know, when you get diagnosed with something and I've been in that position and you go in somewhere and they just say, 
you're going to have this for the rest of your life and you have mm. to take these medications. And it, it, it's awful. They, they go out of there, you know, I did. It's just like, you, you, you're crushed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I knew, I went out of there going, I will find a way out of this, but right now it looks desperate. Most people will just go, I'm gonna do exactly what the doc says, give me more pills, more pills, because they're terrified. I was no less terrified really, mm. because I thought, my God, that's it. That's all my mobility gone. Everything I like doing involves a lot of activity and I'm not gonna be able to do that again. But so now I think the really important thing is when I when I do a consult with somebody, you know, you, you, you get right into it and you take all their case history, find out everything, everything from, you know, have they got uh, amalgam fillings? Have, have they had a, a childhood injections? What, what have they had, you know? Um, <clears throat> what have they been eating? What stresses have they had through their childhood? All of these things mount up and you can get a picture and the docs can't do that. You know, you've got like five to 15 minutes or whatever with them and mm. they don't know how to take it anyway. I just had to, my, my partner, my missus here has Graves disease and you know, she's controlling that with carnivore and, and, and iodine and all sorts. <clears throat> but her her her, her um, endocrinologist, you know, I had to write him this long letter because he said, I want to bring your partner in because you won't have your thyroid cut out. And I said that, you know, you got the wrong one here to sit down and try and convince that she should have her thyroid yeah. taken out or irradiated with, you know, radioactive iodine and put her at risk of throat cancer yeah. in future yeah. and dependent on thyroxine and whatever. So um i wrote him this letter and, and i had to say listen i'm not coming into the hospital because i'm going to have to wear a muzzle i've never worn one not for one second i'm not going to wear one so but i will write you this letter um and i i, I wrote him this thing and the, the, it was a long one you know i i, I like to waffle yeah. but the, the, the gist of it really was that i i think you know I, it was malpractice really that you mm. haven't asked her anything about a diet anything about her lifestyle <clears throat> and you haven't even figured out that she grew up in Arusha with massive amounts of fluoride in the water, mm. which is, you know, a horrendous halide that will stick in, in the thyroid and cause horrible damage. I mean, she's she had uh, so much fluoride when she was young because of the water supply. And so many people who grow up in Arusha and Tanzania do, um, they get fluorosis. You know, she's got like little brown marks on her teeth. She's got, her teeth are great. There's no, there's not a filling there, but uh, you know, and she's coming up 50 or whatever, but she's uh you know she's 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 got fluorosis and so you'd see that and you'd go now that is a real marker plus 20 years vegetarian you know before she turned around um plus that you know it it really is a marker and, and something you need to know if there's a thyroid condition but he didn't even ask and i'm like listen man there are there are these the, you, you you're saying never ever ever take iodine you know never take iodine if you've got graves i mean it fr even frightened me and i've seen through the cholesterol thing through all the crap that's out there <laughs> because but because they were saying you're gonna have a thyroid storm and it could kill you within a day or whatever mm. and and going uh, okay it took us a long time you know and we have this great friend called carno pine who's uh, who has an iodine group and he's on the uh, uh on on our 100 carnival facebook group with some great info and also dr jeremy ayers who, who i work with in the red pill guys and the human unleashed and and they just you know they had to really give us the proper evidence now this is not going to kill you you know and in the old merc manuals that iodine is a cure for for thyroid storm so why is it going to cause it so anyway we eventually got the the, the bottle to do it and actually you know 10 times or more the doses that my mum was taking really piled it in and within a week the, all the thyroid levels were perfect you know? oh, wow. <laughs> it's like come on man she didn't die and now she's been yeah. on the iodine real excessive iodine protocol you know for a couple of years now absolutely fine or let's see 2019 yeah still absolutely fine and <clears throat> so there's all this this miss uh it's the fear-mongering that gets me you know if somebody comes to me they go you know it, or rather if they go to the doc and they, and and you say right you've got six months to live you know and, and they're they're often dead in in, in six weeks or something because the, the fear gets them if the chemo doesn't yeah but with with me it's it's like somebody comes to me and goes and they're obviously really depressed first time and and they'll say, right, I'm really, you know, I've got the, my joints, they don't work. Oh my God, it's it's so painful. And, and I'll just be smiling there and going, honestly, you have no idea what a blessing this is. Mm -hmm. I say, you know, it's hard now, but you're going to come through this and you're not only going to get better, but you're going to be better than you were before because you're going to have all this amazing knowledge for your family and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so excited for your journey. You know, you're fucked up, but it's going to be okay because yeah. this is the way out. 
Imagine if the doc said that, how the difference in the mood when people would walk out, you know, after those 15 minutes. But after like hour and a half with me, you can see them really smiling at the end. They've got hope finally because the docs had never given them hope. Yeah. Because they're only told that those meds will, will do it. And, and I think that's one of the worst things is this unbelievable fear mongering. Because, mm. yeah, we do mess up. We do get in terrible agony. It's not going to be fun for a while, but you are going to get through it. And that's uh, that's what I love, you know, and seeing each concert, they're smiling more and more, you know. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the thing. I think it's, I think it comes from a basic lack of understanding of, of the causative nature of these illnesses. You know, we don't always look at that in medicine, you know, because we don't necessarily know what, what the cause is. I mean, we thought that cholesterol caused heart disease. That was crap. And, you know, and these other things as well, we just don't really know we're, we're getting a lot more information now and it's showing to be, you know, things like, you know, lectins and how they, you know, bind and different sorts of chaos they cause in your body and so forth. And many, many, many other things that uh, are, you know, from plants and plant-based nutrition and so forth and how this affects your body, causing leaky gut, letting these bacteria and other, you know, poisons from the plants that normally pass through your body. Now they get in your, into your system and, and, and cause havoc. They don't understand that there's a disease process going on underneath all of this. They just think, well, here's the problem. This is the best thing we have to mitigate that problem, as opposed to thinking, okay, what the hell is causing this? Does this just happen? Is it purely genetic, like Huntington's disease? It's just like, that's it. You have this gene, you're going to get this thing. But we know that's not true because we have people, even, even genetically linked issues, they have you know, what's called penetrance. You have someone who has the gene and only 60% of people that have the gene get the genetic disorders. Okay. So, you know, there is something else going on. There's, there's an environmental trigger. You have it, it, you know, there's certain things that are purely genetic, right? Few, but like, say like Huntington's, you get Huntington's, the gene for Huntington's, like you're going to get Huntington's by and large. And then you have purely environmental where like someone chops off your arm when you're 30, there's nothing in your genes that were, was going to uh, you know, it, 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 you know, cause you to do that, except maybe, you know, being a dick or something like that. And like everything else is in between, you know, you have a genetic predisposition and environmental trigger, but if you have the gene, but you don't get the trigger, you don't get the disease. You have to have both. And if you have the trigger, but you don't have the gene, you don't get the disease. So most of these things are genetic trigger or genetic, uh, underlying, uh, disorder and, and uh, environmental trigger. And people aren't thinking like that. They're not thinking about, okay, what could be causing this? What, and you don't know what the gene is fine. We haven't figured that one out yet, but what about the environment? What's going on with this person that's causing that, you know, that's something that you can do, but we don't, we don't get taught like that. We don't train like that. And so we think, well, here's this issue, whatever the hell is causing it, this is the pill that goes with it. Where, you know, you, you, if you look a bit under the surface, like you have, like I have, like Dr. Baker has, and, and, and many, many others, um, you know, Dr. Barry and so forth, you start seeing that, you know, the, the underpinning of all these diseases are basically just eating the wrong thing, doing these things to yourself, to harm yourself, alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, plants, spinach, kale, horrible stuff. And this is causing the disease and you remove that you remove these causative factors, then you remove the problem and your body just gets back to business. And until we as doctors start thinking like that again, you know, we're, we're going to keep going down the same path. You know, if you want to keep doing, getting the same results, keep doing the same thing. And, and unfortunately that's what we're doing. That's what we've been doing for half a century. And so it's very important to just keep pushing that idea that, you know, we need to just change the entire uh, outlook and medicine and, and how we approach these sorts of things. And once you get, once you get all this environmental, uh, these, all these environmental influences out of the way, then you get back to just things going wrong. You have genetic disorders, you have accidents, you have, you know, birth and, you know, childbirth and delivery and so forth. You have infectious disease and you have poisonings. That, that's really it. That, that was medicine for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, those, those five broad topics. Now it's all chronic disease. It's all chronic disease. That's the vast majority of what we do in medicine is treating chronic diseases. But, you know, I think of that still in those five categories, but the poisoning, you know, we're getting poisoned and that's 
you know, precipitating these diseases, but they're not diseases. This is, this is a manifestation of poison in your body as evidenced by the fact that you remove the poison and the condition goes away. This is a cause and effect relationship. And so we've just blown up the poisoning side of things because we don't realize that we're being poisoned. Like, you know, I've said before, like the Romans, you know, back in ancient Rome, they all had lead pipes and they got low grade lead poisoning. And people just think, oh, that's just, that's just how you age. You know, your, your hair is supposed to bleed. It's like, no, no, it isn't. That's not supposed to happen. And people figured it out and say, okay, you know, what the hell is going on here? And they figured it out. But for a while there, people were screwed and they were just growing up generation, generationally being screwed. And then people just grew up going like, oh yeah, that's normal, but it's not normal. Look two generations back. That was not normal. That did not happen. And yet now people dismiss it and say, oh, it was probably happening at the same, same rate. We just, we just didn't notice it. Like, yeah, because everyone born before 1986 was an idiot. You know, the guy Da Vinci, like he couldn't, he couldn't, you know, sort his ass from a tea kettle, you know, like, you know, th these people were brilliant people it's just because they didn't have an eye. I, I actually got into it with this guy. He's a, he's a doctor. Um, and he just approached me on Instagram seemingly nicely saying, oh, you know, you had this post about, um, um, you know, about kids and things like that. And there was, there was actually an article written by uh, a group of pediatricians that basically said vegan parents should have their kids taken away because they are harming their children. And this was, this was their opinion. This wasn't mine. And I just wrote a, an article just discussing uh, childhood development and so forth. And, 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 you know, just giving the, the facts and citing, you know, studies and so forth. And so he just seemingly nicely and seemingly honestly, you know, came and was talking to me about this sort of stuff. And, you know, said, so, well, you know, if, you know, first of all, like, you know, if I, if I thought I was harming my kids, I would, I would have them eat meat, you know, without question, you know, not a problem. Like I, my, I value my kids more than I value uh, animals. And so that's fine, but you know, what's, but they're thriving, they're doing great and all these sorts of things. And I was just like, great. I'm, I'm really happy for that. I genuinely am, but are they, you know, are they developing to their genetic potential? I mean, how do you, how do you know that? I mean, they're doing fine. That's an N1 trial. Like you, you're looking at that. It's doing fine. Well, compared to what, you know, as any economist will tell you compared to what, you know, compared to other kids, fine. You're a doctor. Your, 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 your wife is a doctor as well. You know, you got good genes. Your kids are going to get good genes. You, you can understand how many the, the supplements and all the deficiencies and all these sorts of things. Great. So your kid's going to be doing better than another vegan kid and you've got good genetic stock anyway. What does that mean? It means nothing. What is that going to, what's that kid going to do compared to itself? And, um, you know, he, yeah, he, he quickly turned to being, you know, just, just have this facade of, uh, of geniality, but was you know, very passive aggressive, very sort of backhanded comments. And I just had enough with this guy and I just sort of, you know, went for his throat, but like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it makes them very aggressive, doesn't it? I mean, I, the, does, the most yeah. aggressive people I've seen are, are vegans. The, the things that I've had said to me, I just have to laugh really. I mean, it used to really amuse me when Sean, you know, Sean Baker on, on his yeah. videos, he used to always say, uh, now there's a prize for the best death threat for vegan oh, death threat in the comments. Nice. You know, yeah. and they just leave, and they just go crazy at him because oh, I think funny. they knew that finally Sean was on there and and he looked great and and mm. you know and he was a doc as well, and you know he could probably do absolutely hundred reps with Gregor with one arm overhead, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was like you know obviously he's onto something, but they wouldn't yeah. see it. And then they got onto me at one point, and and what about Sean's blood results? You remember when this came out? I think right. it was on. Uh, it was on what what was his name um the paleo dude uh, i've forgotten anyway his podcast and um rob wolf and it was like yeah and it went through his blood results and all that and and he had low testosterone and he had uh, some sort of raised blood sugar or insulin or something mm -hmm. and, and and he'd probably just been training or something and and they don't understand the the blood results from somebody who's carnivore they're, ne they're never really right. quite the same as other people's and I made so I had to make some video in the end, just stop asking me about Sean Baker's blood results because it went on and on. And I went and got my bloods done because the vegans were saying, you're probably dying of diabetes or heart disease like Sean Baker. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, right. Yeah. And so I thought, well, all right, I'll do it. 
But I thought I do have a bit of a worry. I thought because I've got um, I, uh, for thirty years I was teetotal, and every time I had blood results, blood tests done, they'd say, "Are you an alcoholic?" You know, well, in the later years, because mm. they said, you know, your liver results are way off. And I had fatty liver, and I had cysts on the liver. Mm. And um, when I started to go keto, and when I I also introduced liver flushing, which is a bit the only bit of one of the thousand woo woo things that I did when I was vegan, that I still think has some value. And I don't even know if it works as they say it does, but it does do some interesting things. But um, I I did a bunch of those, and uh, you know the keto thing, and then I went back for a, a, a scan on the liver, <clears throat> well an ultrasound, and I said, "Have I still got fatty liver?" And I went, "No, it's absolutely perfect." And I said, oh, that's good. How about the cysts? And they said, oh, you haven't got any cysts. Oh, brilliant. They've gone. Uh, and said, well, no, you can't get rid of cysts. You can't yeah. have had them. And I said, no, really, I did. Go yeah. and look at my 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 medical result, my medical record. So over to the computer, blah, blah. Wow, you did. And this 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 girl, she was turning me over and over trying to look for these, these cysts, yeah. you know, yeah. and couldn't find them. It was like, how did you do that? Yeah. And I said, well, yeah. I told her, you know, and, and the liver flushing process, but also the, the keto. I said, Isn't that dangerous? She said. And I said, yeah. well, dangerous. And, and you want me to take methotrexate and this yeah. is dangerous. <laughs> I said, like, no, it's not dangerous. But um, so I, anyway, I cleaned out my liver and, you know, I would I would just take a sort of sip of alcohol and get really itchy and hated it. And, and you know, all those 30 years or whatever, I, I just couldn't really deal with it at all. So I just didn't drink. And then, you know, into, into the carnivore years, when everything had, had fixed itself, I thought, oh, I'll try some wine and some brandy and stuff. And I was like a teenager again. And I thought, right, I'll, I'll go, you know, it's, it's got to go soon. I thought it's, it's tailed off. But uh, I had a good experiment on it. I thought, let's, let's experiment with alcohol. And I found, as a carnivore, I didn't get a hangover. Now, please, here's a, here's a disclaimer here. I am not recommending alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just decided it's my own choice. And I thought, I'm going to have a go with it. Uh, but I wouldn't get a hangover, nothing. I'd be absolutely bounce out of bed in the morning, no problem whatsoever. And then, but because the vegans had asked me for this, I thought, well, I, I get, I'm guessing my blood results are going to be fine. LDL is going to be up where it should be. Yeah, I should think, you know, everything else is going to be okay. The triglycerides, HDL will be balanced. But I thought, yeah, I'll tell the truth, you know, about what's going on if the liver results come up dodgy, because they were dodgy all my life. And now I've been drinking, which I never did before. And so I went to get these tests done. And, and she said, you know, the, the nurse was reading out the tests. And she said, oh, well, your LDL's up a bit here. And I went, well, that's cool. That's where I want it. Because uh, I'm on a real high fat carnivore diet. And she said, uh, oh, excellent. She said, yeah, that's fine. You know, all this is just a con to sell statins. And I went, oh, nice. oh <laughs> nice. You figured it out. And I yeah. thought, that's wonderful. And so then um, I, you know, I said, but it said, she said, everything else is perfect. Everything's fine. And I said, yeah, well, what about the liver results? And I'm kind of bracing myself. And she just looked at them and went, perfect. And I thought, whoa, okay, I've got away with it. Now I'm again, you know, I just, it does other things. It rips thiamine out. It rips the B bits out. It's not a good idea, uh, you know, but, uh, but I said, experimented with it for a while because it was fun because I missed out on it in my youth. Um, mm -hmm. And uh it, but that was kind of interesting, you know, that I was plant based and my liver was ruined and they were asking if I was an alcoholic. Yeah. And then I was yeah. drinking and really experimenting with it. And my liver was perfect because of the carnivore diet because yeah. it cleaned it out. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm an idiot. You know, I take all the wrong turns in the book, but I like I like to do these sort of crazy biohacks. I've done enough with plants now. That's enough. But um, but, you know, just anything that I can experiment with to prove that uh, the theories are completely the opposite of what yeah. people think <laughs> is it, it's great by me. But, you know, you're right as well. You mentioned about the genetic thing, you know, and, and, and of course, the rheumatologists said to me, well, yeah, you've got this arthritis because you've got this HLA B27 thing going on, you know, and that's what happens. And uh, OK, all right. So, you know, five minutes Googling and, 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 and you can agree with them. And you go, yeah, yeah, you yeah. get that. But then a little bit more digging, and it's like 70% of people with this, this HLA B27 never get any sort of arthritis. And say, like, yeah. no, they're definitely working on the wrong thing there. So these, you know, they seem like gods when you go in there, but they're really piecing together some really daft information. And <laughs> I always liken it to a, a, 
a Rubik's cube, you know, where you get like two or three sides right, and then you can kind of look at it from a certain angle, and it looks like it holds up, but you turn it around and it's it's all over the place. A mess, yeah. And, and then they seem to sort of turn it around, and start peeling the stickers off, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> they don't do the Rubik's cube properly. The studies just get so so perverted to peel the stickers off and yeah. get the colors yeah. in the right place, and and it, it's 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 incredible to see through it now. I mean, when somebody now says to me you know, in a thread or, the, or something, you know, some conversation. Well, I'm a dietitian. I go, oh, dear, you know. Yeah. No, that's that's terrible. But again, I did find, you said that, you know, with your friend there or to chatting to this dietitian, and I remember finding a, um, uh, a forum full of dietitians who were saying, look, we've discovered this. How are we going to go on? You know, what yeah. do we do? We, we, we don't have a job anymore. And this wasn't even carnivore. This was they discovered keto and stuff, and mm. the fats weren't bad. And that was enough for them. It was just like, whoa, how, how do you do that? And how do we go on? And, you know, there's there's a dietitian in um, one of our local hospitals who is quite renowned. Who so Somebody said she needs one of those reversing warnings like you get on a lorry, you know. Yeah. She can barely <laughs> yeah. get she, she can barely get through a door. And then I, f- I found this wonderful um, um, article in the Dietitian's World or something, which is called Dietitians and Their Weight Struggles. And how you should still always listen to a dietitian if they're overweight because there's more factors. And you're like, yeah. come on. All right. It's obviously something's going wrong with all the info that they've been fed, and yet they still come up. I mean, the two just second in aggression behind vegans is dietitians when they come on. You tell, well, I am a qualified nutritionist or dietitian. You go, oh, here we go. You yeah. know, and fruits and vegetables are essential, and you get one of these threads, and eventually it's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah. But uh yeah, the, the the standard education it, to me it's a, the real sad thing is the fear mongering and the, the the horrible states I see people come to uh, come to me too. You know, there was I used to do these kind of ancestral uh, um, diet and ancestral lifestyle chats at a local pub, which has a big upstairs room, and I I'd do some talks every now and again, <clears throat> a place where I, I I know the landlord very well, play a lot of gigs and. I said, can I get this room and we'll do regular sort of ancestral meetups, get guests in, get docs in, get whatever. And I was doing one one day and a friend of mine had said, um, I'm going to bring along a, a, a friend of mine. And um, she's been under the same rheumatologist as you. And this must have been about 2017 or something. And and I would left this guy's, you know, uh, practice in in sort of 2011. He was the guy who got really angry and started frothing at the corner of his mouth and yet when I wouldn't take the methotrexate. Yeah. And so I, I thought, well, okay, uh, this will be interesting because she's been under this guy since about then. And she came in and she was obviously in terrible pain. It's like six years down the line. And um, I, I said to her, you know, how are you getting on with this guy? Oh, well, you know, how's your arthritis? Oh, it's still there. It's terrible. And she said, I'm, I'm on these meds. Um, and, and she tipped out 17 meds onto the table that she got from all sorts of different departments, because then she'd gone for the, for the antidepressants because she was so uh, depressed about it. And she had trouble with the liver. She had uh, the diabetes and there was something, I, I forget all the things that she had developed since she'd seen this guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I've got to chalk it up to him. This guy really gave her a tremendous array of ailments. It was it was beautiful. He must be very proud yeah. with, with how he developed her illnesses, you know, and managed them perfectly yeah. into a, a flourishing set of, of comorbidities. But it, it was shocking to me, you know, and 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 she's still a good friend and she's got a son and I've been on his podcast and he's really up on this. And so, okay. you know, hopefully okay. we'll we'll manage to turn this round properly. Um, <clears throat> but she's a, she was a little bit uh, addicted to her carbs. <laughs> so it was yeah. difficult. But um, it was horrifying to see what had happened, the difference in staying with that guy for six years and being away from that guy for six years. Mm. And I was jumping around doing this and that. And then we had some ancestral movement guy in there and I'm sort of sitting around cross-legged on the floor and bending and stretching. Not, I have one knee that's a bit dodgy from the time it was inflamed and it's nothing like, I, I won't be doing my three hours a day in full lotus position ever again, I don't think, or, or, or ass to the floor squats, I don't think. I, I don't know, maybe if I just stop being lazy with it and really work it, I might do it. But there is some thickening of the synovium there that's causing a bit of an issue. You know, there's no inflammation, but it's just kind of damaged. But to see me doing that, she's going, how do you do that? How do you even get on the floor? How do you do, you know, it was a distant memory for her. 
and and it's uh, I I don't know. I just think the terrible states that people get into with this polypharmacy. If somebody comes to us to you know Dr. Jeremy, like we 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 sort of confer a lot on cases and whatever, and and and, and see these people that come to Kim or come to me or both of us, and you must get him on the show by the way. Utterly brilliant dude. Thirty years he's spent you know doing these things and. And, and fixing people outside the medical system comes from a sort of uh, osteopathic and and, uh, and chiropractic naturopathic background, but then into carnivory and everything. But Jeremy is wonderful, so eloquent, marvelous character, beautiful, beautiful healing um, record he's got with people going back a long way. But you know, we see these people with these real polypharmacy, and it's so much more difficult to fix them. If you get somebody who comes along and goes, oh, I was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis last week. My, my knee blew up last month or something. It's like, this will be easy. You'll be fine. You know, but when you get somebody saying, well, I've got a lot of joint damage and I'm on all these meds and, and they've kind of harmed my liver and I've been on them 20 years, but I've heard about this carnivory thing. You're like, yeah, I can't promise you're going to have the body that you had 20 years ago now, you know, and the meds have done a lot of damage too. So we've got a lot more to reverse than the condition. You've got to reverse all the stuff that these these chemicals have caused and yeah. it's very sad it's very sad they stay on them all this time and you see you see these um facebook arthritis facebook groups i started my own one for anybody's listening it's a real mouthful it's called uh rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis mitochondrial health and carnivory i was thinking how can i get it all into one title yeah. but it's great i got it only about a thousand five hundred people on there i think but it's nice to take it out of the carnival group and have them in there but i had to start it up because I got thrown out of every arthritis Facebook group there is yeah. because he, he, for suggesting for having the temerity to suggest you can heal this naturally. I even got thrown out of the natural healing ones yeah. because, you know, <laughs> you, you go to them and, and you see the first thing you see is their cover photo and it's all full of berries and plants and all these wonderful oh. multicolored eating the rainbow and all that. And you start to mention underneath and then you get all this thing. Well, everyone's different. Don't be so dogmatic. And I'm going, no, I'm not being dogmatic. Eat what you like when you've healed, but just look at the plant toxins. Look at what this is doing. Look at what happens to the gut. You know, look at what happens when the gut heals. Look at the work of Zofia, at, you know, Dr. Zofia Clements, a paleo medicine, medicine in Hungary. Look at how they're healing the guts and testing it with these gut permeability tests that, you know, and, and you can see as the gut heals, the, 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 the autoimmunity dies down, whatever it is. And plants will cause a leaky gut. You can see, no, they don't. You need fiber. How do you even shit? Have you, what, you think I've been seven years, yeah. you know, on a yeah. carnival diet and never been for a shit? Yeah. I was saying on, yeah. on Sean's podcast, you know, that 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 my my turds could be on the front cover of the of the of the glamour calendar for the Bristol stool chart. Yeah. They're perfect. <laughs> you know, like, I want to wake the missus up in the morning and go, look at this crowd pleaser. Look at it, man. You know, it, it's an after sort of years of, of dumping like on dr gregor's daily dozen bowel movements oh, diet you know i mean no it's it's just something tristan haggard said my friend on primal edge health you know he's he's brilliant a carnivore or whatever and he does the most amazing gregor impersonations you got to check out his channel sometime <laughs> and just he's so, so funny um but he you know because he's got this his daily dozen gregor you got to eat these daily dozen toxins you know but Tristan just calls it his daily dozen bowel movements because that, yeah. that's what happens, you know. But but after uh, after that, you know, how the, the the digestion comes online again. But they're always like that, you know, and you get thrown out of these arthritis groups for even suggesting that an all-meat diet would. And I think it's such a shame because, you know, I made a, one of my YouTube videos on my channel is, you know, why, why can't arthritis Facebook groups stop you healing? Yeah. Because, you know, it's just they've got a little bit of knowledge that maybe the meds aren't so good. But then you get them in the in the in the sort of awful support groups for the people on the meds, and they're all on these biologics, and all they're doing is po posting pictures of incredibly swollen fingers, mm -hmm. like sausages and whatever, and they're going and and and, and I'm on Remicade and I'm on this and I'm on that, you know. I think well, it's, if it's not working and it's costing you a fortune, yeah. why? But they've got no hope because these people say there is no hope. Yeah, well, and they and they also say I was like, well, imagine how bad it would be if you didn't take all this crap, yeah, and yeah. you know, and, and of course, if they're doing whatever is precipitating you know, their disease, probably will get a lot worse too. But you know, is it? I know sometimes sometimes the the cure is worse than the than the disease. You know, these people, especially what you were talking about, seventeen medications. That's that is something 
that you literally in, in first year medical school, it's like, don't go down this rabbit hole. Like, don't just go prescribing medications for the side effects of medications and medications and medications. Like, you need to go back to the beginning and go like, this is the wrong medication. Let's try to find something else or a different dose at least. Um, well, isn't, isn't the problem there that you've got too many departments in hospitals and they don't, yeah. one doesn't know what the other one's doing. So, you know, you get, oh, the liver's a problem now because of the methotrexate, right? You go yeah. to the, 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 the liver dude and then you go to this and then you go to that and they don't know what they've all prescribed. And so it just gets, it, it just gets mashed up. I mean, when are we going to have a human body department yeah. <laughs> in yeah. a hospital, you know? Because it all works, hello, it's all connected and it all works together. Yeah. And it's, yeah, well, it, it usually falls on the GPs. You get this poor bastard GP with, you know, this patient with just this laundry list of meds and they're supposed to rationalize their medication list. But, you know, it's very hard for them to do because, you know, they're, they're not specialists and they don't know exactly how important, you know, X, Y, or Z is. And so it, it's difficult for them to, you know, take people off of these sorts of things. And then you get, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen and you've got different people prescribing and, and stopping and starting different things. And you got this poor person in the middle just getting ping ponged around, and uh, it's it's very difficult, and uh, that is something that that uh, you have to be very very careful of in medicine, and always try to keep people on the minimum amount of doses. You know, even I, there are there are things that medications, certain medications, help with tremendously, and I, I'm not ever going to say that that there isn't. It's just that you know certain things that we treat are are better treated through lifestyle and diet in the specific ways that you know we've been talking about. Um, then, then the medication, which is just a band aid, to you know, just to to deal with the symptoms as opposed to addressing the actual condition. Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, go back to like the blood. You know, you're talking about how you posted your bloods and so forth. This is something I've seen. I've been seeing just a couple of times recently uh, in the comments of some of my uh, videos. So, some people were saying not a lot, but there was a, every now and then someone was just like, you know some of the vegan people just saying, Oh, this is bullshit. You know, like, you know, he, they're like totally sick. They look healthy, but they're dying on the inside. He won't even show his bloods and talk about his blood results. How do you know? I'm like commenting back. I'm like, who the hell ever said I wouldn't show my blood results. I talk about my blood results all the, all the time. You know, I was like, I have no problem talking about my blood results. Um, I don't care what my bloods are because I live physiologically. I live, you know, ancestrally and, and I eat a biologically species specific an appropriate diet. So I know that my body's going to be working as well as it can genetically. So I'm fine. Um, but I have a friend of mine who's an endocrinologist here in Perth and you know, I've worked with him in his, in his clinic and he does, you know, functional medicine, bariatric medicine has been doing this for 40 years and had very, very, very good results and doing things in, a, um, you know, doing fasting, intermittent fasting and, um, ketogenic and non-ketogenic sort of things. 40 years before all of this stuff and, and having very good, good results. And I talked to him about carnivorism and so forth. He was very, very interested. And, you know, we got into the details of it and he became more interested. And so he said, well, you know, look, you look healthy, you look good, you know, you're, you're muscular and lean and so forth. Um, well, let's, let's check the blood. Let's check under the hood and see what's going on. And so he ordered this battery of, of tests. And you're just testing absolutely everything. And gave me a call a couple of weeks later and just said, Hey, you know, we should, uh, we should talk about this carnivore diet over a steak sometime because your, your bloods came back and they were, they were very good and we should go through them. And so, you know, I went in and we, we talked about them and pages, pages and pages of these things. And, you know, he, and he looks at things in, in a very different way. You know, we look at generally how you have a reference range for a blood test is the first 2000 people that come in that year. That's your, that's your spread. And they, who gets blood tests? Sick people generally. And so, you know, and old people, young people, all these sorts of things. And so you're getting, you're getting a wide range of healthy and unhealthy people, elderly and young. And so that's not necessarily a, an accurate reference range for health, for optimal health. And so he goes by reference ranges, looking at people that are 25 and healthy. And, and these, and this is the range that, that, um, that you see in those in, in that cohort. And so that's, that's sort of what he bases his, his uh, metrics on. So we are looking at that and he said that going through all my bloods, that if he took a hundred thousand people, my age off the street, that my bloods would be number one without a shadow of a doubt. And I was like, yeah, I, I figured, <laughs> you know, and like said so that you know, the only thing he say was that, you know, your LDL is you know, a little bit high. And I'm like, 
I'm happy with that. It's, that's good. It's physiological. And, you know, I had to explain that to him too. And he was just like, yeah, so that's, that's fine. And, you know, my, my testosterone was just fine. It was, you know, in, in the range, in the optimal range for a 25 year old, you know? So, you know, I, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 40. So it's like, you know, this isn't, um, this isn't something that I've seen certainly. And, you know, you talk about the, you know, the different carnivores and, and, and different sort of people. Well, and, you know, Paul Saladino was talking about how he, his, his testosterone dropped after about a year and a half on carnivore. And then he reintroduced some fruit and honey car, um, carbohydrates. And a while after a while, these things uh, corrected. I, I just, I just haven't seen that. I haven't seen that in myself. I haven't seen that in my patients. I've seen the exact opposite. I've seen people's uh, estrogen levels and testosterone levels normalize. I've seen them get better. I've seen their growth hormone levels improve. I've seen their, you know, they say it's like Saladino was also talking about like after, um, because he just came out with a, with a post about you know, why you should eat carbohydrates basically and, and fruit sugars and so forth. I, you know, I just watched it. And, you know, he was talking about, you know, uh, you know, different sort of biochemical processes in your kidneys and so forth that when you don't have carbohydrates that you end up you're wasting away more electrolytes. And this is why carnivores have electrolyte problems. Like I don't have electrolyte problems. The Inuits don't have electrolyte problems. Everybody in the, in the ice ages and so forth, you know, at least were able to sustain a generational uh, society that they got through 20,000 years of ice ages without any honey, without any fruit. So obviously you don't have to have carbs. And I would argue that, that carbs actually are a detriment, you know, especially fructose. And so he's talking about, you know, magnesium and so forth. And you're just, you're losing this stuff and you get, you get low levels. Well, my magnesium level and zinc levels and, and, uh, you know, calcium and so forth, they were all perfect. And, and that's actually something that, um, uh, Dr. Rensberg was saying, um, that in Australia, the soil is actually quite poor in magnesium and zinc. And so the plants aren't getting enough zinc and, and magnesium out of the soil. So the animals that eat those plants aren't getting as much as they would either. So almost everyone in Australia is zinc and magnesium deficient. I was not. And so, and I was only, and I, I was eating carnivore and I have been eating carnivore far longer uh, than, than Dr. Saladino has. And so I think that there must be something else going on in his, in his particular case. Um, and then, you know, if he's seeing this with his patients and so I, you didn't mention it in the talk that I saw, but you know, if, if he is, there might be something else going on. It might be to do with the recommendations that he's giving. I know he's very into organ meat and, you know, he has a line of, uh, liver, uh, supplements and so forth. I don't know. There's, there is something to be said for that. And you get hypervitaminosis A and this can, you know, suppress TSH and you can suppress your thyroid. This is something that he and like uh, other people have been saying, oh, you go carnivore for a while, your thyroid tanks. These are all people that are pushing organ meats. These are all people that are really pushing liver, especially. And, you know, when you think about the proportion of an animal that is liver, compared to skeletal muscle, it's hundreds of pounds of skeletal muscle to every one pound of liver. And so you're simply not going to be, you know, eating liver in the amounts that we have it accessible to us today in the wild. You know, you're going to have 1% of your meat maybe is going to be liver, probably a lot less. And so, you know, yes, it's rich in vitamins, but that therein lies the problem. You know, you, you know we, the classic one is a polar bear liver that has you know so much vitamin A it will kill you. Well, you know these other things you know aren't going to kill you just by eating one liver. But you keep eating you know a lot of liver, half a pound of liver a day every day. Things are going to build up in ways that you don't necessarily want. And I think that's part of it. And there's other things going to be involved as well. But I haven't seen that. I certainly haven't seen that in myself. Um, well, you make you make such a good point there, which is which is exactly the one that, that that Sean made in response to Paul Saladino's thing. Well, you know, how big is the liver compared to an animal? There you go. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, I think it has its place. And when somebody comes with a very leaky gut, I really like the paleo medicine thing where they say, try and get four hundred grams in a week while you're healing, just because most people who come in are that depleted. Mm. Yeah. Sense. But I, I don't think past a certain point you really need to go and pile that stuff in. No. Um, and, and it, yeah, it is interesting that it does seem to be causing problems when people have it too high in the diet. Um, I, I, and thyroid, that's, that's interesting. I mean, 
I think a lot of the time these blood results are just a snapshot, right? I mean, they can change day to day. And particularly when somebody's healing and we don't know what the body's doing. I think one of the classic examples of this is people, you know, with Hashimoto's and so many women have Hashimoto's at the moment, particularly yeah. women. And uh, um, so many particularly have been vegan and vegetarian or on low calorie diets and all that kind of thing. <clears throat> and you, you get, um, you get this panic that, because I think it was started by, I've forgotten her name now, but she's called the paleo mum. And she put this thing out, you know, that if you, if you go um, keto, then your thyroid tanks. And it, it started off this real fear about it. And what I've seen anyway in people is that quite often when they go keto, um, when they've got Hashimoto's or something, the thyroid levels go a bit crazy afterwards. <clears throat> and, and, if they've if they've got uh, a doc who's taking the bloods, they go, oh, you better get back on, you better get back on some carbs. That that almost killed you. And then they start posting, oh, it almost killed my 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 thyroid. You know, going keto, never do that. And then you go a couple of people I've had where it's same things happen, but they haven't gone back. I say, well, how do you feel? I feel fine. So I say, well, just give it a bit more. And usually after two three months, those levels balance out again. You know, and so the body's doing something that we don't understand and the endocrinologists don't understand. And it's just a little snapshot. It might have been totally different the next day. And just because of that, and somebody put out some fear mongering about our ancestral diet, you know, don't eat what we're supposed to eat as a species because your thyroid will tank like yeah, all of yeah. those Inuit and Maasai, you yeah, know, whose yeah, thyroids yeah. tank. Uh, so I think those they can be a bit misleading. I also had another guy who... Um, who, who came to me and he said, look, you know, since I've been going carnival, I've got this, the, the whole creatinine's gone up and my, my doc's really worried and he thinks my kidney function's going down. I think I'm going to die and all of that sort of thing. I mean, he'd be phoning me up literally a few times a day going, I'm really worried about this. I'm, and then finally his doc did some research and said that, you know, these levels can change when you go onto a carnival diet and it's okay. It's all right. There's nothing wrong with his kidneys. <laughs> it was like, He's going, oh, thank God for that. Do you know my doc's discovered this? I said, well, I told you that ages ago. Yeah. It's yeah. not a problem. Yeah. There's no mechanism by which a fatty ruminant meat diet can blow your kidneys up. There is no way. No. Yeah. There's a couple of ridiculous rat studies or something that show it. But, I mean, you, you also make this point of, 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 of the nutrients and, and, and how they get through. You know that great study with the oysters where they split people, three people, three groups of people. They wanted to find out how the zinc levels shot up in in or increased in the body when you eat oysters. And so they gave one group of people just oysters, another group oysters and black beans, and another group oysters and tortillas. And the ones and they all had the same amount of oysters. And the ones who ate the, the oysters on their own, the zinc levels went up nicely. Oysters and black beans didn't go up so much. Oysters and tortillas, no real raise in the zinc levels. Yeah, And so it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's this old thing when vegetarians go, oh, just add a bit of chicken, you know, for a bit of nutrients. And it doesn't work if you've got it with all your rice and pulses yeah. and stuff like that. It's not going to do a damn thing. Yeah, no, that, that's, so, a, that's a, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, um, I was just going to say. No, no, that was, that, that was it really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. My initial thought and response when I was a kid drinking milk, and I loved, I just loved milk. We only drank skim milk though, because it was all anti-fat sort of thing, which is a shame. But we, I drink a lot of it. I would, I would drink like a gallon of milk a day sometimes. I just absolutely loved it. Unfortunately, I, I wish it had the fat in it. That would have been better, but still drink a ton of milk. And I remember people trying to, you know, say that, that milk was bad. Oh, it has all these growth factors and this is and that. So I'm like, awesome. Sounds good. Free growth. <laughs> you know, like I was like, I was, I was more than happy to, to be a, a large adult, you know, male. <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, more milk then. That sounds great. That sounds like a, well, that's, a, that's a, that's a great point actually, because you know, bodybuilders and whatever have often down tons of milk. I mean, when I was in the gym and doing a ton of training and got big, I was doing a load, you know, and I'd mix a whole load of protein powders in them and down them and fart all day long, you know, like you do. <laughs> but but I was um, I, it, with the with the milk. I mean, it, it is another possibility that if you're really training, then the growth gets channeled into a, a much more of a useful area. Because again, I was sitting with Zofia at the conference. We were talking about this. 
because <laughs> Sean was there, you know, and he's sitting there with his guns out and he's looking like way better than all the other guys who were sitting around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, I was talking to him. He was sitting next to me just before he went up there. And I said, man, look at those chairs. You know, you can't sit in one of those chairs. You've got to get a different one without the arms. You're going to get it stuck on your ass and end up walking around the stage <laughs> with it stuck on your ass. <laughs> So if you notice when he's in that picture, you know, he's got one without the arms on, so he can actually get out of it because there are these tiny little chairs, sort of vegan sized ones. Uh, but, you know, we, we were talking about this and, and she was saying, yeah, it's, it, it depends on your goals, doesn't it? You know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with eating five pounds of ribeye steak a day if, if your goals are building muscle. But when you're in a, an autoimmune flare, your goals are very different. Mm. You know, you, you're, you're unable to train enough to build, to put on any muscle, probably unable to train at all. And probably best you don't until the inflammation's down because it can, you know, it's it's just it hurts and it, it you know, it, it triggers a bit of inflammation anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at, at that point, well, or just some regular person who's who's very inactive, maybe then it does go into some kind of uh, unusual cell replication. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Again, we don't know, do we? I just like keeping an open mind, listening to all these people and start not raging and arguing when somebody says something that's a bit different to what you've heard before, you know? Yeah. It would be interesting yeah. to, um, you know, the effects of, of raw milk just in general, you know, on, you know, people going through puberty and, you know, and, and, and that's effects on other things. It'd be hard to look at that in isolation. Um, I guess you could do raw milk versus pasteurized milk. I, I doubt that that study is ever going to be done, but uh, it would be interesting, especially at a time when you could channel these growth factors into actual growth and, you know, long bone growth and muscle growth and, and things like that, healthy growth. And you get some bunch of Yao Ming's running around, you know, just like just a bunch of raw milk and uh, growth hormone <laughs> diet, just <laughs> smash <Yeah. it. laughs> You, know? you never know. You never know. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I, I've, uh, I've been just doing so. I haven't been to a gym for ages, but I just do sort of body weight stuff and things here, and get my um, symbol case on my back and do some squats, and or a child on my back and do some squats <laughs> as they grow up. And and you know, I can I can put it back on there. It'll be okay. But um, yeah. yeah, you know, my goals in that in that direction are not what they were. But. Um, it's it's just so nice to be lean again, you know. It's like nice to walk around at sixty one years old and and look at all the other guys, even even guys who are quite skinny, and they've all got bellies. The whole lot of them, haven't they? You know, there's always something going on there. Nobody's got a flat stomach anymore. They're either fat or skinny fat, and um, yeah, I'd love to get hold of them all and give them a shake and say, listen, guys, you know, it's real easy. You just need to eat some fatty meat, and it'll all disappear. Yeah. Oh, to only have the problems of a fat belly, eh? That would be so simple for, for yeah. a lot of people. But, but yeah, I mean, it is, um, it has been a hell of a journey since that time. But it's funny, at those times, you just learn so much. The stuff that I've learned, you know, that I've been able to pass on to, to clients about the little tweaks and things, I seem to do most of my learning by getting as sick as possible and then finding my way out of it. <laughs> Oh, man. I'm not doing it again. I've had enough of that. But, but, but you know, that, that's how you troubleshoot, you know, and, and because you've come across that before someone else were going through that, man, oh, no, I don't, don't do that. You know, and, uh, and, and you can, you can head them off at the pass before they, before they go down that trail and, and really hurt themselves. You can, you can tell them the things to watch out for. I mean, that, that is, that's just how we learn. You know, we, we learn about different parts of the brain and what they do by destroying them. And we damage those parts of the brain. We go, oh, God, what, what can this guy not do anymore? You know, or this person has a stroke in this part of the brain. Like, oh, I guess that's what that part of the brain does. Because now, <laughs> you know, and, that, and that's how you learn. And unfortunately, you know, someone has to pay for it, you know, to get that knowledge. And that's why it's, you know, it's, it's hard, hard fought and won. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's worthwhile. And it's, it's worthwhile to pass that on to people so, you know, that they can they can learn from that. Yeah, I think I think one of the important things really is to tell people something that I heard Natasha Campbell McBride say a long time ago, that there's no point trying to work out exactly what it is in your diet in the last few days that's caused some kind of a flare, mm. because it, it can be something that you ate a month ago mm. or even longer, you know, and if you've been backing these things up and say eating a load of dairy when you're autoimmune and, and um, or prone to autoimmunity. I mean, you can see the, the the track of autoimmunity. Really, it's like 
I think it starts off in the subtle ways and these things take decades to build up. You know, when I look back as a child, I used to get migraines. I was healthy and fit and running around, but but I used to get migraines. And a couple of times I got asthma, which I'd totally forgotten about. Luckily, my parents didn't give me any of the inhalers because I think that can just kind of perpetuate it. Hmm. Um, there was a, a, something else that Natasha Campbell McBride said was that once you start doing that, you sort of drive um drive uh, asthma deeper into the body and deeper is a problem and, and you don't allow the lungs to go through that um sort of spasm and sort of whatever it is that's going on there that then they they you get a sort of natural immunity to it if you like not really in that sense but you, you'll be okay like you know if you have measles you're probably not going to get it again um, and and she she says that you know that's that's the way to deal with that. Although it's frightening for parents when the child's gasping. But I, I I never used to I never used to I never got any inhalers. And I remember, I remember like two or three nights where I got it in bed or something like that. And hay fever, just really severe hay fever every year. And now since going carnivore, mm -hmm. I have to look at other people, you know, to find out whether it's hay fever season. I see people sneezing and I go, oh yeah, there you go, you know. And I, I don't have that anymore. But I think little little things like that of the of the immune system just not functioning correctly in early life is is a warning sign that that you know your child or whatever might be prone to autoimmune issues so to keep them a, a more strict like my son peter he's he's uh, just eight and you know he looks amazing he sees he's mixed race just beautiful frizzy hair and just so he looks like a little bodybuilder he's fantastic his body is incredible mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh dense and solid and i think we might have chatted about that on the other podcast but he's so heavy but no fat you know and, and he's basically is he's just been breast milk and meat and that's it oh, and uh you know we we brought him up like that and, and he's amazing but early on he was prone to it he probably had some my genetics or whatever and had some uh eczema and some asthma but the stricter that we keep him Mm -hmm. um the more that 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 just disappears and he doesn't have any of that now but he was sort of he, he you'd, you'd give him like half an apple or something peeled we gave him bits of fruit sometimes and and, and his cheeks would start weeping with the eczema you know just from that but mm -hmm. without um we, we, a bit of chocolate wouldn't do it to him mm -hmm. but fruit would you know but fruit's so healthy man it's <laughs> It's, it was amazing, you know, I, and then I just started putting it in their lunch boxes anyway, just to stop the, um, you know, the dinner ladies calling the social services that they just had meat, but he wouldn't eat it, you know, come back and he'd go in the bin. But I've even given up doing that now. He just goes in with meat and that's it. You know, he's gone in with a load of fatty lamb burgers in a flask today. And, and that's the kind of thing he eats and, and he loves it and he's great. But yeah, I think to spot those trends early on is is, is really important because Sometimes it can be a very slow process. When I look back to um, the early 90s and, and I had a wrist that was really bothering me um, playing drums and it started to really bother me and, and I'd have to sort of go up to the bar and put my wrist in some ice, you know, and I was thinking it was a sprain or something like that. And then they diagnosed it as Kinebox disease, you know, where the lunate bone crumbles and sort of avascular necrosis of the lunate bones called Kinebox disease. And apparently the lunate bone crumbles away and after six months or so it's it's all sorted itself out and either you have not much problems or you lose the use of your wrist or whatever depending on how you built but luckily because it wasn't that it was just a, yeah another misdiagnosis and, and it probably was this psoriatic arthritis re rearing its head early on because that little bit of sacroiliac problems you know a bit in the gym like sort of eight years later or whatever. And that often those arthritic conditions start in the in the sacroiliacs. You know, when somebody comes to me and says, well, I don't have much, but I do have sciatica a lot and I have problems in the lower back and like down one buttock and the sacroiliac. And that's always a warning sign for me because a lot of these, um, these sort of arthritic conditions can start in that. But it got in the wrist with me as well. And it was it doesn't bother me now. I've got most of the movement back there, but you can see that it's you know it, it's lost the movement there, and that was for years. You know it's okay now. There's no inflammation in it, but it did do some damage in there. I mean, whatever's calcified in the in the in the ligaments and whatever. Maybe I should work at it harder, get moving back the other way. But getting the movement back that way has been fine for drumming. I can still play, you know, fine. But that that sort of thing that we don't those little whispers that doctors just are not picking up on. To me, it would be damn obvious now. You know, I'd look at that, somebody with hay fever, somebody putting on weight, somebody 
you know, who, who has some sacroiliac problems and then one joint's kicking off, I'd go, yeah, you know, it's pretty obvious what's happening here. Whether you put one of their labels on it, where they call it rheumatoid, psoriatic, reactive, all, all that thing, it's the same process, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. You know, you've eaten some crap, you've done some things wrong, and here's how to sort it out. And, and that's it, really. You know, nip these things in the bud, nip them early. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I definitely agree. And, um, well, I'm glad that you're you're back on on form. You've put back on your weight. You back up to normal weight now, or or where are you at now? No, no, no. Yeah, because I had some fat, and, and the the weight that isn't hasn't gone back on is probably half the weight that I lost off my legs. And you know, I'm walking around now, and I'm fine, and I'm playing drums at gigs and whatever. But yeah, legs legs still need some building up. Probably about another ten pound would go on there if I built them up. In which case, I would have put back on about twenty five of the thirty, which which. 25 of the 45 that I lost. And so that would just leave the fat loss. So that's fine by me. So yeah, I'm, I'm on track and, and, you know, put back about 20 pounds since January and that's not fat. So uh, yeah, I, I could kind of come out again. It's better the other side than I went in just with a knee that's a bit rickety and needs a bit of work, you know, but that took a bit of a beating, but it was, it had taken a beating 10 years ago anyway, but when you think that I had it in probably like 30 joints, wow. you know, raging and, and managed to get it out of all of them except two without any damage. Um, you know, the first time around the ankles were horrific. I mean, I thought they were just going to end up unusable. And now I, I, I can't imagine I had it, ever had anything wrong with them. You know, I got it all out of that completely, but yeah, it, it, one knee and one wrist has taken a bit of a hammering over the decades, but, um, no, no inflammation. I'm fine now. I'd probably, you know, I can't be bothered with another blood test, but I'm, you know, only when I really need them, do I really need them? But I'd like to snap my fingers and see my CRP now is probably fine. I'm sure, you know, judging by, judging by how I feel, it's, it's probably fine. But uh, yeah, that was a <laughs> on fire, man. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're doing better. I'm glad the weight's coming back on and your kids uh, are helping you with uh, the, it assisted body weight squats or get, get additional body weight squats. Um, and yeah, and, and good luck with that, Phil. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's great to see you as always. Uh, where can people find you and reach out and see your stuff? Uh, well, you know, I've got lots of stuff going on at the moment and, you know, to consults if anybody wants, you know, I mean, Anthony's way ahead here with all the science and all the medical knowledge. But if you want to chat to somebody who's actually been through it and out the other side twice, then I've got some pretty good um, tips and tricks. Um, but uh, yeah, to, to, I'll put my link tree underneath. That's got most of the things. But one of the things that um, I'd really like to to make people aware of is, is what we're doing with the Big Fat Challenge. And we've had everything recorded with like all of the 90, day, uh, 90 days of, of coaching calls, an hour a day on the Big Fat Challenge. They're all there. You can see how all these people are improving. We've got... You know, one guy doing beautifully with coming off his heart and diabetic meds and lovely stuff like that. And all sorts of people losing weight as they go along and me putting the weight on. I was going the opposite way to everybody else. And, um, you know, we've got to challenges each week of different things to clean up from your diet and and in your environment and whatever. And all, all kinds of stuff, um, all sorts of extras and uh, extra courses and books. And we've got our Red Pill Food Revolution book coming out, which... Right. Honestly, I think is just about the it's it's all credit to to Ben. I mean, five, four of us were on it, and 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 we we sort of did Zoom calls on each chapter, and but Ben put the words together. <laughs> and honestly, I think it's it because Ben put it together. I can say that, but it's he's a beautiful writer, and he has done the most incredible job. And it's one I think one of the best, probably the best thing of the history of our diet and how it's all gone wrong and how we've been fooled by the elites and into plant-based diets and through religion and all of this nonsense and corrupt studies. And, you know, it's not a full on carnivore book, although that's, you know, obviously uh, um, approved of, but mm -hmm. it is really what's happened to our diet and that kind of thing. And so you get that and it's not even out yet. And so you get that a PDF and audio book. Actually, I sent you a link to the audio book. Have a listen. Tell me what you think. I, I sent it a while ago. I, I think you've got access to the folder, but it's it. Ben's done it on audiobook now, and um, it's really good. The comments we've had back on it are amazing. And we do it as a pay what you can afford. 
So, you know, you can get it. I think we put it out for $99 or whatever, but, but like, you know, $19 you can get. That's, that's probably the same as the book when it comes out. You get all the other things. But anyway, we do that in the Big Fat Tribe. We still carry on with the calls. If anybody needs some support, I know a lot of people, they can go into carnivory and they're fine. They know what to do. And that's cool and, and, and well done. But if you fancy coming on, uh, there we go. That's uh, www.thebigfatchallenge.com. Perfect. And uh, that's what we're doing. Great. We'll put that in the uh, in the links below as well as your link tree. And so people can find you there. And uh, I hope they do. Bill, great to see you as always. You too, man. Thanks so much for having me on. No problem. Good to see you. I was, I was just going to say, you know, lect that, that's a big thing. Like, there's a ton of different kinds of lectins. And there, there are some lectins. You know, it's a class of molecule. There's, there's a... There, there are some lectins in meat, they, they don't seem to cause a problem, but these lectins in plants use it as a defensive sort of uh, mechanisms. They cause huge problems. One of the problems are that they bind uh, different nutrients. And so when you eat this in, in combination uh, with something that actually has some nutrition, which plants, you know, generally have a lot less. And that was a whole argument in the eighties. I'm sure you remember, you know, they say, that, Oh, you want to lose fat, eat plants, eat celery because it has less calories than, you know, it, there's less calories in that you'll get out of the, the celery than you'll know, take to digest it. So you'll actually lose calories. So if you eat celery, you'll actually be burning calories. It's nonsense. And so, you know, that, that's one of the things though, is that these lectins and, and, and other properties in plants, they actually bind to nutrients that you need and they make them unavailable. And then it gets worse, of course, when you have, um, you know, uh, like gluten and so forth, will will you know, split these gap junctions in your cells and cause leaky gut. And then uh, all, you know, these lectins can get in your bloodstream and then it starts binding to things they're not, they have no business binding to in your body and letting in bacteria and so forth. Uh, and that's another thing too, you know, we're talking about, about nutrients, um, you know, the, the nutrition facts that are on the box generally mean nothing if it's a plant-based food item, because they're just looking at, at, you know, you know, for protein, they look at actually total nitrogen, which is not true. Crude, crude nitrogen is not necessarily protein. Okay. So you're just, this is just nitrogen. It's not necessarily in the form of protein, but they consider it that. And so usually only a smaller percentage of that is actual protein, but then it's like, what are, what are the proteins? Because a lot of proteins in plants cannot be absorbed. They cannot be broken down. 80% of the protein in wheat is gluten. And that is inaccessible to your body. You cannot use that as, as a protein nutrient source. All it does is screw up your gut and cause leaky gut. And so you look, Oh, look, I'm eating wheat. Look at all this protein I'm getting. No, you're not. You're not getting any of that crap. And so, you know, it causes huge problems. A, the, these, these uh, nutrients are not bioavailable. You know, you're just saying, oh, it has this iron, it has this, it has that. Your body's not absorbing that. So that doesn't count. You know, you really can only, you know, when you're looking at meat, all that stuff is bioavailable unless you eat it with a salad or with, you know, something like that, you know, or pasta or rice or whatever, because you're eating these you know, lectins and other sorts of factors that bind the, the, the nutrients and so forth that you want. It screws that up. But if you're eating it, you know, meat on its own, your body gets that, you know, after your gut's healed and so forth, you're, you're going to get, you know, predominant amount of nutrients and so forth from that. You just don't from plants. These things cause serious harm in your body as a poison and also with lack of nutrients and binding actual real nutrients and so forth. So people, people don't, don't realize just how multifactorial bad these guys are. You got your mic. Got some raging. Sorry. Can you hear me uh, now? Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a while to kick in this yeti mic. I see we've got the same sort of phallic Yeti mic, although mine yeah. is multicultural. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah I, I, you know, the, <laughs> the, um, the, um, when you have autoimmunity, you know, I, I mean, there's a, there's a, an old um, <clears throat> saying about bipolar people, isn't it? They're like everybody else, only more so. Yeah. And it's the same with it, it's the same with autoimmunity. <clears throat> you can you can feel what go, what goes on. Like I found that when I was really uh, uh, sick, very flared up, if I had like two mouthfuls or just a couple of fries, I would feel it in the pain the next day. But if I ate half a bar of chocolate, I was fine. Hmm. And it's, so people get focused on the sugars, which are not good. But I think when you're autoimmune, the, the anything fibrous 
is 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 way worse. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'd eat a bit of broccoli and I would be in much more pain than if I ate um, you know, some some ice cream or something. Yeah. <laughs> like the dairy's not that good, but you know, dark chocolate or whatever, whatever, even though it's got oxalates in it, which I would definitely avoid these days, having had the kidney stones from them from my juice. I used to do these smoothies, these healthy smoothies in the morning. And what they used to consist of was a, a couple of avocados, two packets of spinach almonds that I'd soaked overnight so that they'd sort of liquidize and then a whole bunch of uh, maybe coconut milk and and a load of honey you know yeah. and to be honest because of that stuff it covered up the taste of the of the spinach and whatever or the yeah. enormous <laughs> amounts of kale and spinach and it would actually taste pretty good like a like a bit of a milkshake but my god it was oxalate soup you know yeah. and that's that's what that's what caused the kidney stones a total overload I I did yeah um but but yeah, when you're autoimmune, you can feel something very, very quickly. Um, you know, maybe not if you have a thyroid condition or MS or something like that. It might not react so quickly. It's kind of slower. But when you've got arthritis, it's it's excellent. It's it's the best autoimmune condition to have to realize how bad foods are, and yeah. how, uh, you know, because you eat something like a bit of broccoli and you'll feel it. And yet you eat some chocolate and you won't, you know, and it's it, it's definitely down to that. Um, some people say it's feeding the Klebsiella lower down in the gut. So, you know, chocolate's kind of gone high up in the gut. It absorbs those simple sugars. But then when you get the, the, the fibrous stuff further down into the gut, carried down there, then it feeds these Klebsiella, which are kind of associated with things like ankylizing spondylosis and whatever, mm-hmm. uh, um, and, and iritis and all those kinds of things that go with it which is a horrific, having had that five times, you know, that is a, one of the times when, when uh, modern medicine is great. You want to get those steroid drops in, right? To, you know, yeah. don't go and have a steak if you have iritis. If you're at that yeah. stage when that's <laughs> triggering off, you know, that can blind you. Go and, go and uh, do that. But uh, yeah, so, you know, you can feel those fibrous things hugely. And, and, and then when the gut's healed, you know, that you, you can have that. I, I, once in a blue moon, I'll have some potatoes now. It's the only vegetable that, that I, you know, like a couple of Christmases ago, I think I've been totally carnivore for about five years or something. I thought, you know what? I remember how nice roast potatoes were. So I'm going to have a ton of them just with a load of butter, you know, like 50, 50 with butter. It's so nice. <laughs> it's the only vegetable that actually tastes nice is potato. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, and still you've got to have a load of butter with them to make them taste yeah. really good. And there was no reaction at all, nothing whatsoever. And I thought that's ace. You know, one mouthful of that, like ten years ago, would have would have put me on the couch for ages. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so that is uh, that. That's that's really. I see it in my in, in my clients as well. You know, they go, oh well, you know, broccoli's healthy though, isn't it? I can have that as long as I cut out chocolate. And I go, cut out both. But if you're going to have one, have a bit of chocolate because yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it will hurt a lot less. You know, we just don't realize how horrific these things are. Yeah. Amazing. It's yeah, I guess it's hard for people because people still think that just vegetables are good for you. It's very hard to undo that because we've just we've been told and brainwashed by our parents generally, you know, since since we were born, the vegetables are good for you. Eat your vegetables, and they, you know, they end up you know becoming a you know broken horse where they've just they've broken down. Like okay, they fought against it, fought against it. I hate broccoli. I hate vegetables, and then finally they're just broken. Like okay, just tell me what to do, and they're just this <laughs> docile creature, and and it's hard to undo that, but. You know, it's um, it is one of those things because, and I think too because you know in the car in the in the keto uh, range of of people, obviously you do eat vegetables and can eat vegetables, and so that's one of the things that people because they think vegetables are so good for me, they go keto, and then they're like, well, I have to get my nutrition from vegetables. They they they're not realizing the meat is actually the nutrition. And they, they think that's a trick, some trick of nature. You're tricking your body into thinking it's starving to death and, and somehow dying is helpful. Um, it's not generally as a rule of thumb, dying is, is makes you dead. And so, um, you know, these people end up going keto with like a, they'll start eating massive salads, taking lots of, of vegetables and so forth. And I think they harm themselves. I think a lot of people, when they get like a keto flu, you know, they could be, be, de- you know, uh, detoxing, uh, from certain things and, uh, withdrawing from sugar. I certainly see that show coffee as well. And, and then the tons and tons and tons and tons of vegetables and so forth, like you're saying, like oxalate soup and, and these people just feel like crap for a while. And I, I don't really see any 
reason why they wouldn't, I would feel like crap. And, you know, when I do see, when I get my patients and friends and so forth to go on carnivore and I just, they just go pure carnivore, not no artificial sweeteners, so forth, those things are, they're nasty. Um, I don't see them get a, you know, a keto flu or something, which doesn't make sense. You know, you, you've done, you've done fasting and so forth. Did you get the flu two days into fasting ever? No. And so, you know, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, the biochemical switch from running on, you know, blood sugar and having, you know, hyper insulinemia to going back to a normal metabolic state where your body can, can uh, mobilize and utilize your fat stores. Why would that make you sick? Why would that, that give you an inter, you know, raise your interferon and so forth and make you feel fluish? That doesn't make sense. Uh, and it doesn't happen because people just skip meals or fast or whatever, you know, every, every, you know, practicing Christian or practicing uh, Muslim every year for Lent and Ramadan would just, just be, have the flu for a month, but they don't. You know, they actually feel better. And, and you know, everyone, you have, you have tons of studies showing that people feel better, look better, are better, reverse diseases and so forth going on, you know, fasting and so forth. And they, you know, mimic that by putting them on a fasting mimicking diet, which is just a ketogenic diet. And so you, you don't see that. And I think that, you know, part of that is going to be withdrawals. Um, but I think a large part of that is that these people are just piling in the vegetables because they think that's where I got to get my nutrition. As long as it doesn't have a carb, it's good for me. We had, we, people are so myopic. We look at, we look at one thing. This is the end. This is the cause of everything. So before it was fat and you know, cholesterol, like that's it. As long as it doesn't have cholesterol, it's fine for you. They had entomins, you know, you might remember those like coffee cake, fat-free coffee cake, just crusted in sugar. I remember I was a kid my mom looked at me like, fat free. These are fat free. She got two of them. And I was looking at that just like Paul, it was like, I was like, okay, that may be, that may not have fat in it, but there is no way that's good for you. And, yeah. and, you know, we, we had all this. Well, this, is, this is a great one, isn't it? That humans are the only people, uh, the only animals intelligent enough to make their own food yet stupid enough to eat it. Yeah. Yeah. I see uh, that. That's funny. Bang on. I mean, the, it is. yeah, the, the, uh, the whole keto thing is 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 weird because I mean there are some times where people seem to get an electrolyte thing going on and you know if they get cramps or whatever it's it's easily fixed in the early stages you just it doesn't seem to work when you put it on um, on the food like I had a when when I just gone keto the one thing I did get was real um, um, arrhythmias I mean it was really bad there was one point it was my heart kept on and on and on skipping. And there was one point where I was walking around a local town with my missus and she's a nurse. And it's the first time she got worried about me. I was ridiculously skinny. You know, I was like 120 pounds or whatever. And, and my heart was just going and it was missing every third beat. And I thought, I think I'm going to die here. And so I actually went to hospital and they said, um, yeah, we think you, you might be having, having a heart attack or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I, uh, I, I, they stayed me. They, well, they sort of, got me in an ambulance blue lighted me to another hospital spraying this stuff under my tongue you know whatever and uh, I got there and they said no 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 it's not it's just some electrical thing and then they check your potassium and that's all they check and then they don't tell you anything and so I had scans on it 24-hour monitors whatever and they said yeah you do have this arrhythmia thing but um, it seems to be one that's sort of associated with athletes they kind of have it when they're getting fitter and things we're not that worried um and I said, well, OK, tell me whether I can go on holiday or something. You know, I, I was going to go on holiday. Am I going to, am I going to die on a plane or something? Um, and I, I waited a couple of days and the head cardiologist phoned me up and I thought, right, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and and, and in the meantime, I discovered, you know, taking some um, um, magnesium and it seemed to calm it down a lot. But then uh, he phoned me up and, and I thought, God, I'm, this, this is going to go wrong, you know. And he said, well, I looked at the scans. He said, you, you used to have these calcifications and yet your arteries are now clean. And, I, you know, when I went keto, it just seemed to clean up the arteries. I was in a mess, you know, late 40s, like 12 years ago. So I was in a mess. You know, I was a great big fat dude and, and sort of, well, I, I never got really fat. I, I didn't even do that properly, you know, but I was fat. I was fat for me. Uh, and uh you know all sorts of metabolic things going on but then i think it just took a while to balance out but so it stopped skipping so much but it was still skipping occasionally in the day um particularly when i would sit in there cooking or in front of the computer and so there is definitely an electromagnetic thing going on there but i'd figured out the magnesium but i hadn't figured out the salt and it was my son who was um uh, a climber you know and and at the time he was doing a lot of climbing on climbing walls and whatever and he was cramping up 
And he said, have you not, I remember him coming in this door here and going, have you not figured it? He said, you've got to take it in water. It works totally differently. He said, I just take some salt. I bung it in some water if I cramp up when I'm climbing. It's gone. Five, 10 minutes later, it's gone. I can carry on climbing. Okay. But I put loads on my food. And he said, no, no, you put it, put it, in, your, put it in your water and try it. Never had a problem since. Don't need to do it anymore. But I did it for about a month. And, and it just, every time it, it skipped, I'd take some, some, quite a lot of salt in water. And it was fine. And funny, I've seen this again in a group. If somebody does do it, and that happens in, a, in, a, in the adaptation phase, I just didn't know about it. So I let it go on wrong. And I think I had a horrendous electrolyte imbalance by the time. But also, you know, I was pretty fucked from my year of raw veganism or whatever before that. So who knows what was going on in there. But um, I had, I remember one guy came to me and he said, well, I'm all right. You know, he came from consult and, and uh, we chatted about a bunch of things. But the only thing was that his legs were cramping up at night. And I thought, well, to be honest, he's doing everything right. And the only thing is just add some salt in water. And I thought, I feel a bit um, guilty charging him for that. You know, just, you know, we've just had a nice chat for an hour or so. And yet all I've told him to take some salt in water. And then I got this call and he said, that was so miraculous. I've sent you double the money. <laughs> You're joking. OK, the guy was pretty well off, so I didn't feel bad about it. You know, he had a big business in the local town here. But. It was just that fixed his cramping up in bed, you know, and if it does happen, that little tweaks like that can be can be very useful. But to most people, it doesn't happen at all. You know, they're fine. And certainly this keto flu thing. I think you're right. You know, the body's dumping some other stuff. And also, as you burn fat, obviously, um, you know, there's a load of toxins that the body stores in fat. Right. And they start circulating again. So, um, you know, that's why it's, it's often I think that when people go keto, they get these um oxalate dumps and kidney stones or whatever there was some facebook post wasn't there where somebody was asking about that where it was your post or mine about the our last chat uh, and saying that everything's blamed on oxalates and it is i mean we get all these crazes don't we oh it's all blamed on uh, on on uh, um you know carbs and then it's all blamed on oxalates and then it's all blamed on deuterium for a while jack cruz started on with this deuterium thing and so everything that went wrong with everybody was blamed on deuterium. I mean, yeah, it's a combination of all of these things. We have that mindset, don't we, of the one problem and the one thing to fix it that we get we get brainwashed with. And it carries on into the stuff, into the natural healing. And that's why, I, you know, I love looking at people's uh, um, issues. And diet is the most spectacular. It is amazing. When you do change the diet, the, 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 honestly, the symptoms, you know, and it's just beautiful to see them go. And then there's things to, to to sort of mop up those little polishing techniques, and you get people uh, like a guy yesterday, you know, and he had he has all sorts of uh, neuropathy, and he has um, psoriatic arthritis and and other things. Guy I was talking to, a lovely dude, and he's just you can see his mood coming up, his mood coming up, and then suddenly he, was, he I, I found out right he's a trader, and he's in front of the screen, you know, and 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 he's still getting this neuropathy and he's still getting sort of agitated and really wound up. And his, his stress is not coming from how much he hates his work. It's because of how much he loves it and how it's too exciting, you know. And so it's chronic stress still. But he's also got that blue light all day. And I just said, well, just put Iris on the computer, get it, get Iris tech on there. It takes out the blue light, you know, and it stops the flicker as well, which can be very damaging neurologically, you know um and uh, and and he immediately went my god it just feels like a totally different experience looking at my screen you know i, I look at somebody's normal tv i mean we even have an orange screen over our tv here because the kids won't wear the blue blockers um and it, it's it's funny isn't it as 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 a somebody who advises people on stuff like this it's very difficult to make any money because you can't do all the supplements and stuff i mean finally i thought or somebody came to me and said oh you've got a big reach in the carnival world Will you sell these dried supplements, you know, like Sean, like, like, uh, sorry, Sean, sorry about that, like Saladino does. And I remember Sean actually on Twitter saying, why don't you just go back to selling supplements and dog food? <laughs> Did you see that one? Oh, it's funny. And I put this picture up underneath of these two really fat women just fighting with gloves on. Yeah. I don't think yeah. Saladino found it very amusing, but <laughs> Sean did. But, you know, and, and so you, you can't do anything. So somebody came to me, you know, with these all these products of mixed uh, desiccated organ meats and liver and, and blah, blah, blah. I thought, yeah, finally, for people who can't face the liver, they want to do that. Maybe it's something I can sell. You know, that'll be OK. And he sent me some supplements. And do you know what? They just felt wrong in the body. I don't know what it was. And then I I, I had a chat with um, uh, on, online with um, um, 
Chaba Tot at Paleo Medicina and Zofia and said, look, they all say that there's no nutrient damage in this and they're all fine. It's just like the real thing. Is that right? And they went, nah, come on, you know, no, it damages stuff. I mean, it's processed food, isn't it? Is it anything that's processed that we're mucking about with? So I thought, well, I can't even sell them. So what, what can I do? Well, I can sell is blue blockers. You know? <laughs> that's yeah. about the only thing that, that a carnivore a sort of health coach can sell, um, apart from the knowledge. And that's great. That's fine by me because it takes that simplicity, like my autoimmunity course, the subtraction course, just telling people how to get off that pin and not take the aspirin for the pain, you know. Uh, it's it's uh, it, it's it's so miraculous it's taking the stuff away but yeah I, I i agree with you about the processed stuff i i think that i think i think those desiccated organ meat supplements i think they're a bit of a waste of time as well you know if you're not brave enough to eat a bit of liver maybe your body's telling you you don't need it or, or maybe just yeah. man up and do it and whatever you know but just nah no pills can't be asked with them yeah yeah that's my my big thing with with uh supplements is you know, if you need to take supplements to get basic nutrition, then by definition, your diet is deficient and a carnivore diet isn't. And, you know, if you, I, I go a lot by taste as well. Like you say, you know, if, if you're, if you're rejecting liver, you, maybe your body doesn't want it. Raw liver tastes very different from uh, cooked liver as well. I found it actually tastes good. I, I, I actually like raw liver. Uh, that's something Adele Davis, who was one of the early nutritionists in the, in the early 1900s you know, she wrote several books on nutrition. She actually was way ahead of her time. And one of, one of the big things that she, she came back to regularly was raw liver and, uh, and seemed to help quite a lot of people. And, and she actually was already subtracting things out like, okay, well, people are having problems with certain things. Well, let's, what are you eating a lot of? Well, let's take that away. Let's take that away. Let's take that away. Let's see what happens and then see how you're doing. We'll add it back in. And then people actually had big reactions to it, you know, because as we see in carnivore community and you know, I'm sure in certain ketogenic uh, people that have eliminated something from their body for a long time, they don't have the same tolerances that they had. And then when they reintroduce this after several weeks or months, they can feel a, a bigger effect. And part of that is the contrast. You're just, you're, you're feeling healthy now for the first time in your life. And now this is making you feel less healthy. And you can see that. Whereas before you had so much stuff going on in your system, you just always felt like crap, but you called that normal. And now you actually feel normal. You actually feel great. And, and now that's bringing you down. So you can see that, but also because you, you don't have as, as many you know, uh, defenses and so forth and tolerance is built up for these sorts of things. So it, it could ostensibly hit you harder. And so she, she found this as well, that you reintroduce these things and people get slammed with them and go, okay, avoid that thing, whatever that was, stay the hell away from it. Um, I found that if you, if you slice up liver and like salt it, I put it on drag. I, I, I don't know. You know, some people see my videos, but I take my steaks, I I'll wet age them, and then I'll cut them up into steaks, and I'll I'll salt the outside, and I'll put it on drying racks where they're not touching. You can't have them touch, or they'll have moisture and and um, bacteria growth. But it's something that Alton Brown, uh, who's a you know celebrity chef, talked about, and, and um, that my mom picked up. She loves loves cooking, and I just started picking up, and I now I, that's all the only way I eat meat is like, I'll salt it and leave it for at least a day, if not several days, and it'll dry out more, it'll brown so much better, it'll cook so much better, it tastes so much better. And I did that with liver. And after just a day or two, it tasted better than any piece of liver I'd ever had in my entire life. And then after several days, it started turning more dry and started getting like this gummy texture to it. It was like, it was like gummy meat. And like, that sounds disgusting even to me, but like I loved gummy candies. Those were my favorite candies growing up. And all of a sudden I'm eating like gummy meat and I just loved it. I'm like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And so that taste was, was a good response for me. But, you know, after a little while, it was like, it was, it was nice to sort of do that. But eventually I was just kind of like, yeah, that's enough. I didn't, I didn't really want any more. And, um, and that was it. My and son did that. My, my yeah. six year old, you know, who you met and, and, and he used to just, you could give him a whole plate of liver and he'd ask for more. Yeah. You know, he knows, and now it's like, no, nothing. Yeah. He's had enough. His body's just had enough of it. Yeah. 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 And, and, that, and that's how taste goes. You know, when I, when I'm eating a steak, you know, when I'm hungry, when I haven't eaten, it's the best damn thing I've ever had in my life because my body wants those nutrients. So I'm getting that positive feedback. And as I keep going, it just tastes slightly less good, slightly less good. And I eventually get to the point where it's like I'm really not enjoying this anymore. That's why I generally tell patients how to gauge how much to eat, especially if they have had, you know, 
very differing portions, some people not eating enough, some people eating more than they should. And so that to readjust their portions, they need to learn how to listen to their body. And one of the main things is, is listening to the taste. And I've certainly noticed that with liver. And, you know, since then, I, I, you know, I haven't really felt the need to get any more liver. I just, I bought it once. Um, I've, and people keep asking, oh, you have to do organ meat. You have to do this. And, no, not really. You don't, you can, if you want to, but you don't need it. And I can count on the fingers of one hand, the amount of times that I've eaten liver in the last 20 years that I've been doing carnivore off and on. And I can count on the fingers of two hands, how many times I've ever had liver in my entire life. Hands down. I don't take any supplements. I don't take, you know, uh, any, any, any pills or, or certainly don't take any, any hormone supplements and so forth. My, all that was fine. And, and, and I don't even need to take, um, vitamins and magnesium and zinc, even though I'm in a zinc and magnesium deplete country, uh, everything's just fine. And so, and I don't eat liver either. And I've been doing this a lot longer than, uh, people like, you know, Dr. Saladino has. So I, I don't know why he's seeing the issues that, that he is generally when I see patients struggling with, um, carnivore, you know, early on, you could have some, some, you know, electrolyte sort of imbalances and you can, you can sort of give a bit of supplementation at that point, but you can test for these things and you can see if that's what's going on and say, Oh, my magnesium is probably low. Let's test your magnesium. It's not low. Okay. So that's not it. And then, you know, move on from there. But, you know, you, generally those sorts of things like the cramping, I generally find that you get a bit of that in the beginning and then it sort of normalizes uh, afterwards. And it sounds like you did as well. I even got a bit, a bit of cramping um, for a bit. And then like I went to, you know, the tropics, I was in, uh, uh, Bali and I was just getting outrageous cramps in my calves, like every night. And I did the same thing. I put a bit of salt in a, in a thing of water and I just drank it and it would calm down. I could go to sleep, but that happened every night for like three days. And then it, and then my, it just, my, my son, my son who, um, told me about that now lives in Bali. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You need to know it there. You know, like, you know, people go, you know, like the, the, you know, Brits and so forth would be traveling through the tropics. You always have these little salt tabs and things like that, to, you know, putting your water to help with cramping and so forth. And, um, yeah, and that's it. You know, I've, I've never had to, to supplement, you know, the people that, you know, I, you know, work with and so forth, they don't need to either. And they don't, they don't seem to get these problems. And so I, I don't, I don't know what Saladino has, has I don't know what's going on differently there, um, but you know, generally... you know what I think it is. You know what mm -hmm. I think it is. I mean, I used to listen to tons of his podcasts, and they're absolutely fascinating. How he goes through the science and whatever. I can't take mm -hmm. in more than ten percent of it. I just sort of listen to stuff and I go, oh, maybe that's why that worked in practice. You know, all I see is things working in practice, mm -hmm. and it's very very simple. And to me. It's it's about I got one there's a video on it on my YouTube channel about is eating only meat boring or something, um, and it's about how, when you refine your tastes when it goes from wanting all the time you want pizza and chips or ice cream basically because you know that combination of fat and carbs that doesn't happen in nature that is hyper palatable and 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 away it goes you know you can't stop eating them but once the tastes have refined you start to get really interesting things. Like I'll have a day where I'm totally averse to beef, but I really want lamb Yeah, and vice yeah. versa. Or I'll have a day and it doesn't happen so often where I go, do you know what? We need some oysters, you know, and we'll have a great big oyster binge, you know, and just eat them all raw. And then I'll, I'll end up with a really bruised hand, you know, from opening the yeah. damn things. And I'm going, right, I'm not doing that again for a while. They're too much hard work for what you get out of them. But something in me tells me I need that. And sometimes I just, I, I used to eat eggs every day, right? But not anymore. I don't like the whites. I think they're very inflammatory, particularly for people with any, any autoimmunity. They can be very, very painful. And the yolks can even in the early stages, but they're, they're, it's great nutrition in there. And every now and again, I just want some yolks. And, and I, I have this feeling that I just need a ton of egg yolks over some burgers that I'll grill, you know, that I'll make up from some ground beef or whatever. And then I don't want them for a while. And you get that sort of subtle uh, taste where, where, where you've got rid of the, 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 the mad frenzy for carbs and, and, and fat combination, but you just kind of know what type of meat you want. And I've got too much liver in the freezer now, and we just hardly ever get it out. But, you know, like once every couple of months, I'll go, yeah, I need some liver. And, and I'll cook some up, and the first bit is great, you know, and that's fine. And then I kind of leave them in the fridge 
and just eat a couple of bites like a carnivore biscuit while I'm cooking something else, you know? And then after a couple of days where it's been in there and I go, do you know, I just don't want any more. Anyone want any of this liver? No, we don't want any more. You know, I've had enough, you know, and it ends up, you know, either force yourself or just throw it away. And it's the only meat I ever throw away because you don't, you don't get the wastage that you get on plant foods, do you? You yeah. know, but if they've given you too much of a big pack of liver and you cook it all at once, the first little bit is fine. You think, yeah, my body wanted that for that day. Mm. But yeah. after, you know, it, it, it is, it's just the, the refinement, that, that sort of subtlety, subtlety that we've lost in our taste, where we just want something that just blasts us, you know, something with enormous amounts of um, sugar or, or something else horribly addictive. But um, yeah, once you've been carnivore for a while, don't you find, you know, people come along and they go, oh, I can't give that up. I could never give that up or this yeah. or that or whatever it is they're addicted to. And you go, well, you'll see down the line, see what happens. And sort of 30 days, they'll be going, oh, I've got such good um, results over it that I, I, I don't really I don't really crave it so much anymore. But I still crave this and that. 90 days in, they're like, yeah, there's two or three things I could still maybe have sometime, but I'm not bothered because of the amazing results. But the rest of those things, I don't even think about them anymore. You know, it's it, it's sort of refined the taste. And I think that's one of the most magical things about it. It puts you much more in touch with what our taste is supposed to be. Yeah, I, I found the same thing. And, you know, to the point that I have, you know, friends that have, you know, since gone carnivore and sort of danced back and forth with it. Uh, you know, their family, uh, a friend of mine in particular, um, was always very meat based, but ate all the rest of the crap too. And then he, he, you know, he tried carnivore for a while and had, you know, was having fantastic results, but his, you know, his, the rest of his family weren't really on board with that. And so he sort of slipped off of that and he likes, you know, he likes the odd drink and so forth. And so I think that's a lot of things that, that sort of pull people off of it as well as they start, they start drinking and then they start sort of saying like, ah, well, what else can I do? Well, it's not that big a deal. And it's sort of a slippery slope, but he, um, you know, I was talking to him one day and I was saying, I was making some ribs, I was smoking some ribs. And he was like, oh, yeah, you know, I've got this great recipe. You got this rub, you know, do this and have this sauce and do that. And I'm just getting horrified. I'm getting more and more <laughs> horrified at this guy. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, stay the hell away from my meat. And because I, I really enjoy and, and appreciate just the taste of the meat itself. And so, like, when I get ribs, I'm like looking forward to the ribs, not the sauce and the seasonings. Like, I, I don't want that stuff. That's going to mask the taste that I want. My mouth, literally my mouth is watering right now thinking about that. And, you know, and I just said like, uh, yeah, no, I think I'm going to go without a rub and a sauce. And he's like, Oh yeah, you're just going to go without flavor. I'm like, buddy, if you're, if you, the only flavor you're getting out of ribs is the sauce and the seasoning, like why the hell are you eating the ribs? Just, you know, just, just, just have a mouthful of the sauce. If that's all you want, you know, you're obviously cooking pretty poor quality ribs. If you have to mask the flavor, with all this crap, just eat the damn meat. And so like, I just really enjoy the taste of meat. And, and like you say, I, I, you know, taste is what it's supposed to be. You can get these subtle nuances of what your body wants and like this tastes better than that. And so you just naturally do it. Nature is natural. You just, you just automatically do it. If you're eating what you're supposed to be eating, you can actually listen to your instincts which is wild because normally people say like, no, 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 no. You have to leave the table hungry. You know, you never eat enough, always be all these sorts of things. I'm like that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, they say like, well, when people like eat in times of abundance, then you store fat so that you can go these, you know, fast, you know, fast and feast sort of things. And like, yeah, that's, that can happen. But, you know, you look historically and quite a lot of the time people had food, you know, abundance of food, access to food all year round, you know, the, you know, early, you know, cavemen and so forth, they were running herds of, of mammoths over cliffs and they were just dashing themselves to death at the bottom. They were not, you know, poor on nutrition. You know, they dry this stuff and, you know, probably make, you know, a, a version of pemmican that the, you know, the Native Americans did. And they'd have the, they'd have this meat the rest of the damn year. And they probably had a ton of wastage. You know, they probably just had so much that they had nothing to do because they could just run another elephant over the over a cliff. Big deal. And um, and eat again for the month. So there were these people that, that had an abundance of food. There was, um, you know, they looked at different people. And if you, if you measured wealth by the amount of work and time and effort that you have to put in to getting what you need to eat and to live and to maintain life, if you, if you have that as a measure of wealth, 
they found that Native American tribe on the um, on the Columbia River in Washington State, in Eastern Washington, was the wealthiest civilization to have ever lived because they had these weirs set up, these nets all across the Columbia River, and they would catch these big 90-pound salmon constantly. And so they didn't work. They had nothing to do. They just, every day, they just got up and just pulled out a bunch of fish and ate it. They, their entire life was leisure. The entire civilization, their entire life from birth to death was leisure. And these, they, they didn't have to work for their food and so forth. It was always provided. And so that's not right. Uh, you know, so you, you didn't necessarily have to just eat all this stuff. So, you know, you do have a natural off switch. You, we have a thing called satiety and people have experienced it like I'm full. And so if, if that theory was right, that, you know, you just, you're just always going to be ravenously hungry so that you can build up a big fat store so that you can survive days and weeks without food. Well, you wouldn't ever stop being hungry, would you? But people are. And when you're, and when you're eating naturally, you just naturally just go, I don't, I don't want to eat anymore. Um, you know, pe people think about this. Um, you know, can think about this in, in context of, you know, we see in nature, cows stop eating grass at a certain point, you know, they know when to stop, you know, see all these obese guys, there's a lot of grass in fields, tons of it, I've seen it. And so, you know, they just keep eating grass until they just, you know, just popped, but they don't, I mean, they're, they're lean and strong animals, lions, they take down a big, you know, buffalo or even an elephant and so forth, you know, they think, they think that all, all these animals in the wild, where they're working out all the time, and they're and they're exercising all the time, and they're uh, and they're they're very food deprived. Not not male lions, you know. They generally do f all, and uh, you know they're involved in the hunt and so forth. But generally, they're around for for defense of the of the pride. But they get first cut of whatever they killed, so they go for they get the lion's share. They generally go for the belly fat which has, you know, the belly meat that has the most fat. They, they, people say, oh, they go for the organs. Do they? There's a lot of fat, fat in the abdomen. There's a lot of fat around the organs and so forth. That's where the most fat is, is in the abdomen. And so I think that yes, they eat the organs, but I bet you they're getting a lot of fat with that as well. And that's probably the driving force there. Um, King lion gets to eat before anything else gets to touch that thing. And you'll see in, in these videos, 20 lions in a circle around. It's just, they can't wait to go in there. Their eyes are just like, Oh my God, I, I just want to get in there. And they, they're not moving because, you know, daddy's going to mess them up if they get near his, his plate. And so King lion could just gorge himself until he puked, but he doesn't, he ends up going to a point and he just goes like, yeah, I'm done. Rest of you kids can come in. And then they do. And they pile into it. Why don't you see fat lions? Why don't you see, you know, big fat pudgy male lions? You know, they say, oh, well, they, they work out so much. They're running around well, in the wild. No, 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 nobody brings so many hagen das afterwards where you get that yeah. extra stomach. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. You know, because they're, they're eating what they're supposed to be eating and their body tells them, yeah, I'm done. I don't need to do this anymore. And people say like, well, it's just because they're in the wild. They're running around all the time. They're exercising all the time. Well, first of all, we know with the Maasai that they did studies in the 80s that these guys look like they were like Olympic champions. They were just ripped. And yet they only worked out and exercised a 1.6 times more than the average American, which in the eighties was very, you know, um, you know, stagnant lifestyle really wasn't doing too much, but you know, you, you can, you think about it more, um, you know, more directly. They say, you know, well, these, these animals in the wild, they're just, they're, they're, they're always lean because they're exercising all the time and exercise is what makes you lean. You know, like, as you know, Obviously, you have to exercise and do cardio to get abs, right? It has nothing to do with anything else. It's purely exercise, and that's how you get your fat down. Wrong, because that does not explain animals in the zoo. You know, animals in the zoo live in a box the size of a small apartment, and they live their their entire lives as the definition of a sedentary lifestyle. And yet, they don't. They you know they don't get fat. They they get ripped. They look like they're on steroids. And you know, unless they're giving them carbs and grains and crap like that, most zoos will not do that. Most zoos give animals what they eat in the wild. And as you can ask any zookeeper that knows what the hell they're doing, if you feed an animal something that it doesn't eat in the wild, something that didn't evolve on, it gets sick. And it gets the same things that we do. It's heart disease, liver disease, diabetes, cancer, obesity, you know, autoimmune disorders, arthritis, and so forth. Same with dogs and cats eating grain and plant-based kibble. And same with us eating grain and plant-based kibble. It's all the same thing. It's all toxicities and poison from species inappropriate diet. And if you eat a species appropriate diet, you will naturally 
eat less, you will naturally monitor and restrict your calories to what your body's asking you for, you know? And I think, and taste has a lot to do with that. And I think that, uh, like you say, I've, I've been pretty amazed by that as well, that my, you know, my taste, which is a heretofore ignored, uh, sense, you know, one of your five main senses where people are just like, Oh, that's, that's for my enjoyment only, you know? Um, no, that may, that, that thing does a lot of work and I've really, uh, yeah, I've really found a new appreciation for that as well. Oh yeah. I mean, you see all of these people with fat pets and you just know what's going on. They're eating biscuits. Yeah. That's it. You know, and the, and the, and the, and the vets say you need to give them some more exercise. I remember seeing one of my neighbors yeah. once and he was sort of dragging this barrel shaped dog with these tiny little legs that could hardly reach the ground around the park saying, Oh, the vets told me it needs more exercise. Okay. Yeah. Come on. He can't even walk. It's not going to get any exercise. Yeah. The damn thing's yeah. so fat. What are you feeding it? And he goes, oh, the biscuits. You're feeding it those those horrible dog biscuits and all that crap, aren't you? And he goes, yeah. Well, why don't you actually feed it what it's supposed to eat and see what happens? I never thought of that. He said, yeah. <laughs> it's weird, man. I mean, we've just got this little cat. And he was sitting on top of the drums packed up there just before we went on. But he's run off and done something else now. But, um, he, you know, he's just raw meat and he's just fantastic. I, I'll be amazed mm. if we ever have to take him to the vet. You know, right. he's yeah. had nothing, yeah. nothing but raw meat. I mean, we did make a mistake and give him uh, lamb and beef to start with. And uh, he, he was he was getting all the runs and stinking the house out. Hmm. And then I hmm. suddenly thought, hold on a minute. Why am I being so stupid? This is a cat, right? We It doesn't get rabbit starvation. We do. This is a this is an obligate carnivore. We're facultative carnivores. We're mo- mostly like lipivores, really, aren't we? Fativores yeah. as humans. <laughs> But this cat, it doesn't do well with all that fat. So as soon as I put him back on chicken and rabbit and small things, you know, then he's absolutely fine. You know, it just, it, it, turds don't even smell. You know, you don't even know when he's done one. That is fantastic. But I mean, animals just don't eat. You give that cat a bit of broccoli, it's not going to eat it. You know, we have a, we have a corn snake and you give it a, you know, something, something, even yeah. a piece of meat, even a piece of meat, you won't eat it. But it's got to be a whole animal, you know. These creatures are not stupid enough. They'll they'll eat exactly what they want to eat, what they're designed to eat, you know. Yeah. And yeah. we need to get back to that. This is what we do, you know. In, in when we um, with with our work in 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 the human unleashed, really, and the red pill stuff, it's just showing how much all of our ancestral stuff has been covered up. You know, that ancestral model doesn't work for everything, you know. It doesn't work if you know somebody's got anaphylactic shock or something, yeah. and you go right, well. You know, have a bit less screen time. No, you know, you, you need some steroids there or something. You need to bring that down. But if you've got uh, if you've got somebody with all these layers of things wrong, we just don't even know because we've been fooled for so long. And and to take all these things away and just give somebody the, the real appreciation of that, because you don't have to give up. You don't have to go live in a cave. You can give up. You know, you can you can get your light cycles right by getting out in the morning without first getting on your phone and getting your light, the natural light, wherever it is get grounded every now and again, you know, do a little bit of exercise, do some, do some high intensity interval training, do a bit of lift some weights and then go lie down, have a big steak, lie down, chill out, you know? And some people, I think, well, most people now have got, they're not even, um, I was thinking about that when you were talking about the guys who just, you know, catch the salmon, they don't have to do much. And most people can't even be with themselves anymore. They don't, they don't have the ability to, to, to just hang out. You know, what I like the most is going out carp fishing and I'll, I'll i'll go for like 24 hours at least and just sort of midday to midday and i'm out all night and i sleep there in a bivy and the rods are on bite alarms all night and if i get a fish it wakes me up but i like these difficult lakes where you don't get woken up too much you know but when you do it's a monster and that kind of thing <clears throat> and just to be able to sort of wake up in the middle of the night and see just natural light and see the stars see the moon and see and just be content with that and most people aren't most kids have never seen that you know they're just in a screen yeah. all the time They've never seen them been out at night. They've never walked in the woods at night. They've never, and we've become so disconnected from all of these things. And all of these things are so healing, you know, when you, when you add them up and you don't have to lose all your technology, just learn how to use it in better ways. You know, if you have your laptop on your lap, don't have it plugged in so that don't have it on Wi-Fi so that it's, it's sort of frying your balls, you know, <laughs> no, don't, don't do stuff, things like that. You know, you have take breaks between it, get the light right, get your stress down eat a carnivore diet. And it's just, it's very rare where you see something that doesn't unwind. You know, I, I, I'm yeah. kind of sad at the moment because 
you know, as, as I told you, I'm off down to my best friend's funeral. Yeah, and cool. he was he was just you know all his life he was just one of these guys who could do anything and he was muscular and ripped, you know he looked amazing this dude you know if you think of sort of a more attractive version of Patrick Swayze you know that's kind of what he looked like you know he was always very annoying that he'd eat anything and just stay really ripped, but it caught up with him in a different way and he got this ALS thing and and just absolutely wasted away, and I didn't you know I I I remember asking around asked. Uh, Zofia at Paleo Medicina, have you ever had any success with this? She said, it's the one thing we've really not had success with. And, um, you know, and uh, uh, Jack Cruz, you know, I, I talked to him about it and he said, yeah, probably you could, but you'd have to do everything right for every moment of the day. He said, you'd have to be somewhere completely stress-free by the sea, you know, in the sun, being grounded all the time, never doing a damn thing wrong, getting exactly the sun you need, exactly the sleep you need, exactly the food you need. And that's very, very difficult to do, to, do, to put yourself in that situation. But it was a, it was a difficult one to, to, to see him sort of this sort of real powerful muscular dude end up, you know, really wheelchair bound and sort of stick thin. Um, but, but he was, and, and, and he was, he just knew all about this stuff, you know, he knew all about it, but it was too much for him, but it was too late for his body. Uh, but unless you've got something like that, which I think is 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 one of the maybe the most terrific things, you know. All sorts of things are manageable. Like I was thinking the other day when my friend Andrew Scarborough sent me something um, about how he's being hassled at work by all these horrible, you know, mandates and whatever. And he works for the NHS here, but Andrew had glioblastoma, and he did have the the operation, and then he's controlled it since with a with a carnivore diet. Oh, great. And he was going, and you, you should have a chat to him. As a neurosurgeon, I think you, you'd, you'd find some great stuff to chat to. He's pretty well known out there. There's a load of interviews with him and whatever. He's, he's pretty young, 36. Um, I met him a few years ago when I was at the uh, biohacking summit doing a, 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 a chat with Jack Cruz um, uh, with him on the stage. But, send me a, send me his information. Yeah, that'd be cool. I will to do. Track him I will do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, I think I think I was thinking about that that you'd you'd have a real interesting chat with him. Mm. So I believe there's another guy who's 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 reversed it with um, without having the surgery at all, um, because you were saying you know sometimes it pops up in other hemispheres and whatever. Yeah. You know, even if you cut it out, and obviously if you don't change your your your, your lifestyle, it will do. But I think when people have something like that, they're so terrified. They'd be very terrified to go down the natural route. But Zofia uh, and Chaba, they've got results with with brain tumors. You know, they're uh, reversing them or at least stopping them, you know, on this, yeah. their paleolithic ketogenic diet, as they call it, the, you know, very high fat um, carnivore diet. And uh, people are sort of making inroads into that. But but Andrew's very knowledgeable about all of that. And, and he'd be great to chat to, you know. Mm. Uh, uh, he's he's a good guy. He's done it. He's got a lot of stuff out there. I'll, I'll, I'll send you his contacts. I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up on Facebook or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I think that pretty much anything, any lifestyle disease, autoimmunity, metabolic stuff, this will nail it. So, you know, if anybody's listened to this and um, I, I'm definitely going to put this one up in my, um, in my arthritis group. So guys, if you know, if you're listening to this here, look, you know, it's not just, it's not just some daft old drummer here who's saying that. Yeah. Here's a dude who understands about this stuff and has been at it for like 20 years or so. So, you know, uh, I think uh, I, I think it would just be lovely when it comes out in the mainstream, you know. And uh, but will it? It's just the corporations, isn't it? And yeah. this is what we're trying to uncover in the red pill stuff: the history of how diet's gone wrong and how it's been covered up for religious, spiritual reasons to sort of make people suggestible and weak and. Mm. Any, any sort of rulers you've seen the rulers and then they feed their, all their their slaves grain and they're all in there eating all the meat you know they know it's fine and and the slaves they can eat this this crap you know and this is how it's been done over the happening again and you know old bill gates and he's pushing his plant-based crap and all of these corporations are and this is this is how it's um this is how it's happened and I think at the moment, I think with all the, the sort of hoaxes going on, and I won't get your channel pulled down by getting into those <laughs> subjects <laughs> now. But, but you know, it's it's it, it's obvious that we need to make a make a stand for meat because of the, yeah. all the pandemics and that they're faking and 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 uh, you know among the livestock as well. 
Um, you know, obviously, I would never suggest that, uh, that our present situation is a hoax. Wash my mouth out. <laughs> but, you know, um, that's what we're trying to do. And we've got a book coming out called the, 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 the sequel to the Red Pill Revolution, which was more general of how this has mm. happened. The Red Pill Food Revolution. And honestly, I think it's a beast. It's all five of us contributing to it and Ben writing it up, Ben Hunt. So it's 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 Graham Norbury and uh, Dr. Jeremy Ayers, John Gusty and me. And I think we've really nailed it in this one. It's sometimes something just touches you where, you know, like you get Monty Python, which was great, but then suddenly they did the life of Brian, which was came from God, I think. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it was it was just inspired. And I think this is our version of this where we've just nailed it with this book. And we just keep looking at it going, wow, we, that, that is really good. And, and you know, Ben's really modest and, 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 and he just sort of put up privately, so I'll embarrass him here. We said, I think this is the best book I've ever read, let alone written. <laughs> and I think, I think you're right. I think we just sort of got, got that right combination of coming at it from all the different angles. And I just love it when I see uh, somebody like you speaking out because, you know, you, you um, with letters after your name and stuff like that, it's, uh, it just inspires people so much and you bring people in so much more and uh, brilliant. So, you know, let's carry on. Absolutely. Getting this crap blown up, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> well, Phil, hey, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, how can people get in touch with you? How can they find your work? Oh, thank you. Um, well, my website is called pureactivityoneword.net. And um, I'll send you this stuff for the show notes, but uh, it'll philescott.com apparently goes to it. And that's my my website with um, with consults and blogs and this and that. Um, all sorts of stuff on there. But my YouTube channel just under Phil Escott has a lot of carnivore stuff on it. And um uh, autoimmune issues uh, sort of hopefully with some ideas about those and um, I have a, a course an online autoimmunity course called the subtraction method that you can find through my sort of uh, Facebook groups and whatever and then where I met Anthony here my 100% carnivore and beyond group which is a nice irreverent one we don't throw people out for posting pics of broccoli we just might take the piss a bit you know yeah. <laughs> but it's not strict and we deal with other stuff beyond carnivory to other ancestral disconnects and but what i'm really proud about at the moment is uh is this work i'm doing with the with the other guys with um with john gusty and ben hunt and graham norbury and jeremy Ayers. and it's uh it's the redpillrevolution.com and we have our books there and we have we do all sorts of chats that would get uh, my YouTube channel pulled down and we do discussions on this lunacy that's happening at the moment. But then our sort of sister um, project, the Human Unleashed, where we have hundreds of hours of videos on God knows what and loads of all the health stuff and um, Q&As every week for members and that kind of thing. And, and we have a lot of fun on there too. You know, none of this is very serious. Um, well, we're dealing with very serious issues, but we have a lot of fun between us and get on real well. So you know, we're going to have to get Andrew on there as well to talk about, about some of the things that he can't talk about too much in public. And he teased me with some of them last time off air. And I've, I've, I've excited the boys about that as well. So maybe we'll sneak him on there to talk about some naughty stuff. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's where you can find me really. But, you know, put my name in Google or YouTube. It'll probably come up. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Yeah. Hey guys, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week, if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. So, but when you're on a carnivore diet and you're, you're fat adapted, keto adapted, then you will, you will just constantly replenish your glycogen and your ketones uh, from your fat stores. We know this from, from studies in wolves in 1981. They said, they, oh, you know, 